I set them out and they keep pulling me back in. What's up, everybody? Um, yes. Some weird things going on, things that I wanted to address. I'm not really interested in the goobers on the internet who make videos about me every day in terms of responding to all those goobers. Uh, we will be doing the debate with Trent Horn. He's at least uh, a respectable opponent. Everybody else is a bunch of goobers. And goobers are really... Um, well, they're a candy. We were talking about candies in our last stream. I mean, the goobers that we're talking about here have... They look like that. that's what they have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner is goobers. So we're not interested in uh, replying to all of those people. Uh, we are going to reply to Trent, and that will be... It uh, looks like we're going to do a debate on natural theology, so that's great because uh, hopefully down the road uh, we can set Ubi up a debate, or Cabane, a debate with Trent on um, that kind of stuff. And then we can focus on you know something other than talking about the papacy all day right so i mean that's the debate's been had a million times it's really getting old so it'll be nice to debate something else like epistemology and thomism and i'm really eager to do that really eager to uh, combat that system of natural theology but Prabhu Babu Gungunga, Prabhu Babu Gungunga, Gumda da Katata Saki, Um sucking on the Saki, Teat from the Saki, Saki from the Teat. Yes. Somebody sent me this video <laughs> of Prabhu Boomer Pandi. Or we'll call him Boomer Pandi. Sri Boomer Pandi. <laughs> and he has some arguments about Jesus was just a sage, brah. Just a, a Vedic sage. And I'm not going to play his videos, as you know, but we will play the audio. I did link the video, so you can go watch Sri Boomer Panda if you want to. And he will tell you all about the mysteries. And another point I want to make, too, is a lot of people seem to think that I'm I, I don't have a cult and I'm not interested in being a guru. So we, if anybody that comes to the disc Discord, as you guys all know, we tell you to go find... A spiritual father because that's not my role so don't expect that from me and that's just simply not what I'm called to so don't worry about any of that uh, I'm very happy doing what I do and so there is a so we're gonna play this guy's videos oh yeah I need my notes I took notes on this guy's video somewhere I don't even think I need those notes. We can just go directly to the text. And I mean, the, the arguments are not that sophisticated, but it would be good to do some rebuttals to some things that are not super sophisticated because most people who you know have objections or who come into the Discord or whatever, they don't always have you know five thousand IQ objections. Now I'm not knocking people that have simple objections. At times, everybody has simple objections. Most people have simple questions or objections. Uh, where is the Discord thing? Let me find this here. And then I'll have the link for you guys too. Because after this, pro priority, of course, is given to Super Chats. And you can Super Chat via the Streamlabs. But... You can also do Q&A via the Discord if you're interested in joining. Uh, we have a police department in the Discord. <laughs> Not a literal one, dummies. A uh, 
Dire Court Police Department, and they do a great job. Shout out to all of our great mods. Eastern Orthodoxy is just as heretical as Gnosticism. Is that right? Well, JT, why don't you join the Discord? There's the link. And you can come on the stream. I'll give you some time here in a little bit. And you can uh, voice all your objections. And so, you know, I, we've had literally a stable, like an entire stable was opened in the last week of mentally ill people. Many of whom, I'm not joking, mentally ill people, PTSD people, people j that, that just got out of an institution. I'm not joking. Uh, all over Facebook, all just the n most insane stuff. One guy said that because I held a book up like this, that I was doing the all-seeing eye symbol. <laughs> uh, one guy said that he knows that I'm KGB because... I talk about CIA subversion, and the only people that talk about CIA subversion have to be in the KGB. And when asked uh, how that's possible, given that the KGB has been defunct for 30 years, uh, these people don't know. They don't know anything about that. So uh, then we had another guy who uh, was literally mental. So there's mentally unstable, just just unstable stables. There's stables of unstables. Just let loose. Uh, but these people can't... The, the weird part is that is dealing with people that have lost their reasoning faculty. And it is possible to lose your reasoning faculty. Did you know that? You can lose your, your, your reasoning faculty. In fact, um, you know, drugs, alcohol, that kind of stuff, it causes people to lose their reasoning faculty. And you're not uh, totally... Guilt, for example, if you committed a crime, is not totally mitigated just because you've lost reasoning faculties. It could be. You could have an insanity defense, sure. Um, and I, I don't have a problem with there being, you know, a place for insanity defense. But people who uh, do have at least some use of their faculties, people who are in institutionalized. And you notice, by the way, I'm not being mean. It's just a fact. There's at least two or three people that we've done debates with. If you have been following for a long time, two years ago, a couple people that uh, we let on, and they had breakdowns, right? We, we had a uni aide that had a breakdown on air. Remember that? The guy, for a year straight, begged to come on for a debate. And then when given the public platform, the, the audience, he crumbled, had a meltdown. Um, we had another guy. Roman Catholic guy, if you remember him, also not being mean, but had obviously had mental problems. So there's something about this this domain, right, where it's like uh, people who I think, and this is kind of what we're going to get into a little bit with the guru. Religion attracts people, obviously, of all walks of life. And certainly a lot of people go into religions seeking healing, betterment, answers, enlightenment. Sure, yeah, mystical experiences, all those things. But one thing that also attracts, that the, 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 the religion does to attract people is attract psychopaths. It attracts the narcissistic, psychopathic person and uh, the narcissistic, psychopathic person oftentimes wants to see themselves as some kind of a savior, believe it or not. And uh, there's actually studies on, for example, far leftists uh, that people have talked about. Um, obviously, I don't agree with everything that David Horowitz says, but there, David Horowitz actually has a really good point about this, which is the mentality of the, the leftist like the sort of champion social justice type of person is that it's a, like a savior, like a God complex, basically where they want to save the world, uh, supposedly, or they see themselves in that God savior role. Now, again, JT, uh, you're welcome to stay in the chat, but I'm going to ask that if you do want to come chat, you you can come to the discord uh, or you can come on the, the stream and chat. But 
like you can't just spam Protestant stuff in the chat so again there's the discord you're welcome to come join us and we give anybody who's an opponent you can have the floor so you you can uh, come in and talk about whatever arguments you want to you can make as many arguments as you want you have to understand what an argument is though an argument is not why are you KGB? How come you're an occultist? How come you took a picture in front of an inverted cross? Now, those aren't arguments. Those are questions. Dumb questions. But those aren't arguments. Yeah, I think that it's when Horowitz is talking about people like Alinsky and the, the sort of the average leftist where he makes this really incisive psychological analysis of the, the left the left-minded person. Anyway, so we're going to notice that religions like Hindu, Vedic, etc., whatever, these allow for the creation of the sage, the guru character, or the guru archetype, the old, the wise old sage archetype, right? This is Oshos. Oshos has wisdom of Bogor Wishos. Literally, Osho has the greatest Osho has the greatest booger whistle of all time, as we've noted many times. So there is a, a wisdom in the booger whistle, but actual substance, no, not so much. Uh, and that was one of the funnest streams I ever did, Tristan and I, uh, covering the whole Osho thing. But we are going to listen to uh, I don't even know his name, Sri Boomer Pondo. We're going to call him because. He did about a 45 minute, we'll say, uh, video talking about, talking about how Jesus is not what the Bible says, and he's not what the Old Testament God represents, and he's a Vedic master, Jesus the Avatar. So we're going to listen to his arguments, we're going to critique the arguments, we're going to see if they are coherent. I'm going to have to go find my argument because actually, because there's one point where he commits a couple fallacies and I'm going to have to go because I wrote it all down, but let me go grab those arguments, but you'll know very clearly when he does it, it's going to be really obvious. Um, this is going to be a more of a, uh, mid level kind of apologetic critique. So, uh, this should be sort of appeal to a lot of people. Um, you're not interested. Okay, then why are you here in the chat to argue beliefs if you're not interested in arguing beliefs? So you're about to get. Uh, so then why are you here to debate? So you're about to get booted. Goodbye, dude. Uh, you get you got multiple opportunities to come discuss, defend your position. Uh, so you're not going to do it. Goodbye. All right. So the guru. And, and that guy's interesting because he's kind of an emblem. He's emblematic. The guy that I just booted is emblematic of what gurus do. Gurus attempt to present a higher position, right? Above dogma, above written books. Although Hinduism has like vol dozens of volumes of books, but you see the master is above the books and he's, you know, has the direct experience of the divine. It's not a direct experience of a personal God. It's a direct experience of the divine, whatever that is. Um, and so the guru is, you know, sort of the figure who has merged with the absolute experienced it directly and then gives us, you know, the teachings, the path, the wisdom so that we can supposedly, down the road hopefully maybe experience it directly as well and not through a teacher and that's going to be one of the key arguments that Sri Boomer Panda makes which is to say that Jesus is not establishing a church a religion uh, a set of disciples to believe in him or to believe in some propositions of dogma Jesus is there to be an example to get you to experience what Jesus experienced. So you're going to see, yes, an adoptionist, Nestorian, Arian, Jesus is going to be key to who Jesus was. And he sets up a false dichotomy that it's either you believe in Jesus or 
you are the direct experiential merging with the divine mystic, right? See the, see the difference there? That's what his argument's going to be. So uh, I'm going to grab my notes because I put them on the table in there. And I'm going to go ahead and start his talk. And we'll hear this guy kind of give his argumentation. And you'll notice, again, it's going to be a pretty... This is, this is going to be a mid-level kind of apologetic challenge. Uh, I don't think this guy's talk would appeal to anybody except people that had really low-level knowledge of Scripture, a really rudimentary knowledge of the history of the church, church fathers, patristics. Um, it would really only dupe people maybe kind of new to, like, I'm really into religion. Like that girl, like the girl on Instagram the yoga girl on Instagram wearing her yogurt pants, this kind of chick would totally fall for this dude, right? This dude's probably racking up phone numbers from Instagram yoga chicks just because he's spitting that mystic game, right? Divine consciousness, mystic yoga, meditation, the all, the absolute. And the yoga chicks are like, oh, oh my gosh, I love you. It's so mystical, clarifying. Right? Literally, this guy would, oh, here we go. Not all who follow Dharma are impersonalists who merge with Bamat yat ga et wet wet rush yet. It sounds like a David Lynch between zone, right? Like the Black Lodge. Yep, yep, but when I hear the people doing it, so I don't care, dude, because it's not Yahweh, it's not the personal God of Scripture. I'm sure that you have Hindu theologians because it's a massive mega syncretist system. I'm sure that you have people who have said, the all is personal. So, but it doesn't matter because the argument is not all hinged on whether the absolute is impersonal or personal. But uh, again, and we, we're going to bring it back to transcendental argumentation, tag, precept. These arguments are going to just melt away in the face of precept. So let's let's get going here. By the way, we did get a thank you for the super chat already. What's up, boy? Yeah, boy. Oh my gosh, your karma is like off the charts, and the way that you do your Booker Wessel show. It makes my yoga pants tingle. Osho. Dude, Osho's booger whistle has dogs barking a mile away. Did you know that? That's a fact. <laughs> All right, let's get three Boomer Panda talking, then I'll go grab my uh, my notes. He does some kind of weird prayer at the beginning of time. I'm going to skip that. Where he chants to Osho or whatever. Is that every week we have an online satsangha. And what that means is that I generally tend to give a talk on some aspect of the Vedic scriptures or about Vedic spirituality. My aura is very bathed. And that now. is usually followed by... Okay, dude, yeah. We, we we're going to have only questions and answers and that's to make up for the fact that okay dude in from asking questions because i'm not going to see them and i'm not going to answer. oh the other reason that we're doing this by the way too is because so a lot of people uh, i actually had a friend who uh no not really into christianity anymore i'm not going to name him but many many years ago and now now he now he separate from the other guy who sent me three boomer pandas lecture another dude who separately messaged me again within like the same day being like, Hey, uh, I am reading into the sort of Hindu Vedic stuff because it's more in line with traditionalism. 
perennialism. Um, so is this true, right? Is Jesus a uh, itinerant hippie, basically, is what we're at, looking at here, right? Jesus is a wook. I'm not being blasphemous. This is what these people think, right? Jesus is like a festival kid who like, wanders around and talks about mystical things or something. People have no knowledge of the scriptures, no idea what Jesus taught. And they're going to believe ridiculous things too. Like, oh, well, the scriptures don't actually record what Jesus taught. We don't know. Oh, but by the way, we do know what Jesus actually taught because there's a text in this uh, obscure Vedic book that says that he went and studied in the Himalayas. I'm not joking. In the Himalayas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Himalayas. Jesus is in the Himalayas. Oh, but by the way, we don't actually really know what Jesus taught, right? So it's always this back and forth. Remember, everybody do does this, right? Where they um, play the back and forth game, right? Contradictory, moving the goalpost, ad hoc. Oh, let me, t let me show you all these Bible verses that prove what I believe. Uh, any other verses that you use, those are made up. Okay, uh, excuse me, sir. What is your evidence that the verses that I'm citing, which are sometimes in the same chapters as you are made up? Uh, well, scholars say so. It's just, they just say, people just say stuff. <laughs> they have no idea what they're talking about. Never read a book on, right, textual criticism on the history of the formation of the canon. Don't know anything about how the canon came to be. I mean, we're talking about people who have never read the Bible, okay? So, in order to do this, we want to be able to have read the Bible many times. First of all, again, for apologetics purposes, if you haven't read the Bible, you're not ready to do apologetics, Okay. You need to have been through the Bible multiple times, multiple times, first of all. And that's not all that is necessary, right, for apologetics, if that's what you're into, or you can rely on apologists. But as you know, the Discord is there. Our Discord is there uh, precisely with the intention of training apologists and has been very successful. We have, we have trained many people in the last two years. And thank God, as everybody now knows, uh, by God's grace, and through our co-working with God, we have seen the conversion literally of thousands of people to orthodoxy in the last couple of years. So we're, we're uh, very thankful, happy for that growth. We're almost at 8,000 members in the Discord, so uh, you, you feel free to join there. We'll ask this question in a minute, but uh, I'm going to let uh, Boomer Ponda talk, and then we give my notes in the other room, and so don't go anywhere. Answer them. In any case, again, please wait till the next time we get together, and you can feel free to... Uh, ask any questions that you wish pertaining to Sanatana Dharma and all the aspects of Vedic spirituality. Before we begin, as always, I just want to make a few very quick announcements. First of all, just to remind people, we are in the midst, we, that is the International Sanatana Dharma Society, our movement. All right, no, we are in the all that. Come on, dude. We know that the Christmas holiday season is something that is of great importance, both spiritually, but also even culturally. Uh, indeed, it's interesting. A person can even be can a semi-atheist or not really interested in spirituality whatsoever, but nonetheless, they'll still celebrate Christmas as a very important holiday. And given the fact that indeed Christmas is coming up, I thought I would take this opportunity to give a talk very specifically on the Vedic understanding of, of who is Jesus, what okay. are his teachings, yeah, what is his significance vis-a-vis -vis Sanatana Dharma, the Vedic tradition. And this is something that many people have written about. Actually, this is not a controversial topic. Indeed, some of the most famous gurus throughout history have spoken about this, have written about this. Uh, Prabhupada, for example, wrote and spoke extensively about Jesus. Uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and trust me, I can go on and mention hundreds of Hindu gurus. I'll use that term because some of them are more legitimate than others. But within the greater sphere of what we culturally call Hinduism, again, many, 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 many individuals, Was swamis, many? gurus, etc., have spoken about Jesus, and 99.9% .9 of them extremely favorably so. So I'm not the only individual who has given this sort of a talk explaining what precisely is the Vedic understanding of Jesus. However... 
this is an older talk, by the way. Th this is a guy who is influencing supposedly these conservatives and traditionalists. I don't know. I don't know who this person is. He says that he is a PhD in religious studies, so uh, we'll take him at his word and we'll analyze whether he has an accurate understanding. But you're going to notice some funny things about his uh, view of Christianity. Um, but so that's why. But why? I mean, Christmas. Don't you celebrate Diwali or whatever <laughs> Christmas? However, this talk will most likely be the most comprehensive in understanding this person. First of all, before I begin, again, let me just say that I personally am not a Christian in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Yeah, we know that, dude. You're a, you're and a, interestingly, you're a yogi. even though, again, I was born and raised in the Western world and individuals who are not very conversant with the West might think that by default, I must have been born and raised a Christian. Uh, I have never been a Christian in my entire life, actually. Uh, my parents were nominal Christians. Um, they weren't very religious in any way. Uh, I believe that when I was extremely young, maybe they took me to church maybe once a year uh, for Easter or, some, or something like that. And that only lasted for a few years. I was never baptized, I was never confirmed. Again, I personally was never a Christian in any way whatsoever. Okay. And I certainly am not a Christian now. I am a follower of Sanatana Dharma, of the Vedic way. I am a practicing Vaishnava. My theology and philosophy and practices are all what are called the Vaishnava Dharma. I consider God to be Sriman Narayana and all of the aspects of Sriman Narayana, that just is all of the mystical. avatars, or like, all of the ooh. plenary portions, etc. And my personal approach, as well as that of the ISDS, is radically orthodox Vedic, and with nothing else added to that. <laughs> Again, people who have followed... Well, it's glad to know that we're not listening to a liberal Vedic guy, and then it's an orthodox Vedic guy, right? my teachings for a very long time uh, are extremely aware of that, that I don't mix and match. I don't add other religious content to Sanatana Dharma. Um, and the reason why I'm saying all this is because, unfortunately, there are foolish people out there who, because I'm talking about Jesus, might suddenly now say, oh, I guess a Chatterjee is a Christian after all. I will admit, though, that um, I did have a period of following um, Sri Shyamalan. Uh, and Shyamalan Dharma has to do, there's basically uh, three acts, and essentially at the last section of Sri Shyamalan Dharma, there's a twist. And then you realize that the whole time that you were reading Sri Shyamalan Dharma, you were Sri Shyamalan Dharma the whole time. Like you were the Dharma. You were Shyamalan the whole time. That was the twist, and it comes in the third act. And the weird thing about it is that it's not like Sixth Sense, right? You, you always forget it. So whenever you reread the book, you don't you don't know what you forgot that that happened. So, and you don't remember it until you're enlightened. So that's the following. Uh, that's my system of Sri Shyamalan Dharma. Well, if that's the case, then again, all the gurus I mentioned also must be, including Prabhupada. There, are, there have been literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gurus just in the past ooh, 70, 80 years ooh. who also have said essentially what I am about to say in this lecture. And that does not make them Christian, and neither does it make me a Christian. I am a follower of Sanatana Dharma exclusively. Okay, dude. We're now, all that being said, what we're going to be presenting is indeed the Vedic teachings of uh, the Vedic teaching on who precisely is essentially there is no Shyamalan right if I had a if I had a tiny little Shyamalan here there is no Shyamalan and then I can watch this watch this I can make the Shyamalan bend there is no Shyamalan Shyamalan is an illusion. Don't think about bending the Shyamalan. Think about him not Shyamalan bending you and all reality around it. 
is Jesus? What are the what is the validity, if any, of his teachings, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And this is what we'll be talking about very specifically. And before we dive very deeply into that, the first distinction that I need to make is that of Abrahamism versus Dharma. So this is you know key. this is something I've written about very extensively. This is something that I've spoken about very extensively. Indeed, we have at least one video, maybe more, where I am interviewed and I go very deeply into what are the differences between the Dharmic worldview, and by that we don't mean simply Hindu, we mean basically everything that is pre-Abrahamic versus that which is Abrahamic. So I'm not going to go very, very deeply into that because, again, in other places, I go probably deeper than anyone ever has. Whoa! Uh, in writing dude. and, again, in other ways. Into Now... Uh, I'm getting a little bit of uh, Mark Brahman vibes here, right? Because you guys remember when we had a debate with Mark Brahman. Mark Brahman pretty much went deeper than anybody's ever done and, in fact, solved the entire Bible and the, all the mysteries of Western history and philosophy, if you remember. Pretty much nobody's ever done what he's done, like greater than anybody. So kind of getting a little bit of Mark Brahman vibes here. Now, why are these disaffected Western people attracted to this jibber-jabber? Is it the fault of M. Night Shyamalan? Is he sneaking Sri Shyamalanga into his movies? Is that what... Were we all just moved by signs and the village so much that we didn't even know was he enlightening us that we didn't even know avatar Sri Shyamalana perhaps or is there a situation where in the history of western Christianity due to the defects heresies flaws heterodoxy errors over many centuries and the religion essentially becoming humanism as St. Joseph Popovich talks about in his books the religion of man the religion of the Pope the religion of the papacy and it's it's a the papal protestant versus the protestant protestant right that's the way uh, St. Joseph Popovich talks about it is that what it is that then drives western man whose soul is empty deracinated and sick of consumerism to think that Christianity is that so therefore let me turn over here to these things let me turn over here to Dharma yeah exactly to what are the distinctions but let me just say that certainly Abrahamism and Dharma are diametrically opposed spiritually, philosophically, as far as worldview, as far as aim even, as far as their goals. They are diametrically opposed to each other in, in every way. There is, sadly, zero reconciliation between the two. There is no reconciliation. Now, this is interesting, because so remember this claim. This is where he hinges the entire argument at the beginning. The presupposition that Jesus is a totally contrary figure to Abraham and Abrahamism. This is not a new argument. <laughs> this is an old argument, and this is an old argument that Paul dealt with extensively. Why do you think Paul spent so much time talking about Abraham? I'm trying to figure out where the bl best place to have uh, blessed Sri Shyamalana, Sri Shyamalan, so that he can help us here. By the way, I, I think old was pretty, pretty good, actually. Had a good message. So, shout out. Shout out to Sri Shyamalan for his movie. Uh, and then, since you didn't get your super chat scene, let me repost that. That's what, so once the soy boys all move past atheism, right? Then you, it's going to be at a point where you just say these guru phrases. Dharma, and then they're going to do the soy face. Dharma! 
consciousness. All right. Thank you for that. We'll get to the super chats here in a moment, guys. But we're just having fun right now. I know we're not really getting into it yet, but I hope you guys are having fun. I'm having fun. Well, you know how much fun we have around here, especially when we're hanging out with M. Night Shyamalan. And by the way, what if this whole stream is just a twist, dude? By the third act, I then pull a meta Shyamalan on you, and then I rip off a mask, and I'm Shyamalan. <laughs> what if I was Shyamalan the whole time, my whole life? I was M. Night Shyamalan. That would be like the greatest six. That would be this twist of six cents. Conciliation between Dharma, that is natural law, versus Abrahamism, which is actually anti natural law. So that's the first distinction that needs to be made. Now, that being said, what are meant by the Abrahamic religions? Well, again, without going too deeply, essentially we're talking about the Judaism mainstream Christianity. By the way, he never defines natural law, right? And we never get a clear idea what what he thinks it is or what he is talking about. And again, this is a, it's not an a priori term. I mean, the history of philosophy, theology, Western civilization, orthodoxy. I mean, these are nuanced things. So we don't exactly know what he means by natural law or why he thinks that Abrahamism Abrahamism is anti-natural law. So I, I don't recall him ever explaining what that is or why that is. It's just a early on presupposition in this guy's argumentation. That is the vast majority of Christianity and Islam. Theologically, those are the Abraham, the three largest Abrahamic religions. But then, of course, there are offshoots of this. I have made the argument, and very, uh, I think very successfully so, that interestingly, Marxism is a philosophical offshoot of Abrahamism. And again, without going too deeply into that, just read my book, The Dharma Manifesto, where I go very deeply into this, and I show how Marxism, even though it purports to be atheistic, is actually satanic. <laughs> it's actually Luciferian. But more, it is quite literally an offshoot of Abrahamism. And then there are smaller offshoots. Uh, I mean, he says this, but we never hear why that is. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to be, well, the God Yahweh, um, you know, is somehow just a cloak for a kind of evil manipulation tactic or something like that. Right? This is what we're hearing a lot of pagans, right? So now we're beginning to see why this doctrine from this guy is very similar to the apologetic, so-called apologetics that we hear from the neo-pagans, right? It's almost like the exact same. And keep in mind, what's the, the what's the underlying assumption and commonality here amongst these various silly positions? The God of the Old Testament is a different God and a mean God. Literally, almost all of the heresies uh, in the first and second century relate to this so marcion the adoptionists countless heretics um had this radical uh, opposition between what they thought was going on in the old testament versus the new testament i'm gonna get irenaeus out here in a little bit we're gonna look at some of the irenaeus stuff that talks about this in fact as you as you guys know right tertullian wrote uh, uh, extensively against marcion um, other apologists early on, I mean, Irenaeus, right, uh, tackles uh, Marcion as well. But notice the Marcionite assumptions that you're going to see coming through. And it's it's annoying too because this guy says, oh, I've got this like greatest philosophy work ever over here. Uh, but I'm not going to use any of those arguments or cover that. I'm just going to give you the boil down position. I'm sorry, but uh, I really doubt he actually has <laughs> the, the, the great arguments somewhere else. And at a certain point, you're going to start realizing that this guy doesn't know anything about the history of Christian theology. He literally thinks all of Christianity is, is evangelical fundamentalism. I'm not joking. This guy has no knowledge of Orthodox theology, no knowledge of Catholicism at all. And so to think, to critique a position, okay, that's understandable. You don't, you don't believe it. You don't agree with it. We expect you to critique it. 
but to have no knowledge of what Christianity taught from the time of the apostles through the church fathers, through the, the ecumenical councils up until Protestantism and to just act like it's all evangelical, like fideism is kind of preposterous. And it just shows that most of the time, the level of people that you're going to be dealing with in apologetics is very low tier. It's very rare that you're going to get really sophisticated people only kind of if you're interacting a lot with academics, if you're in university, if you're in a circle of academics, um, if you're on our discord debating with people, then perhaps you might run into more sophisticated argument. But most people, most of you guys out there are going to be um, interacting with really low tier stuff. And so, uh, so somebody is saying that this, that he thinks the art or you're saying the argument is that Abrahamism is circumcision and that's Marxism. Okay. Not, I don't see how that follows. Um, I mean, the irony is that Marxism historically comes out of Plato. Do you dummies not know this? Does this guy not have a basic knowledge of the history of Western philosophy? Anybody who has a BA, BS, whatever in philosophy would know that the origins of Marxism and communism are Plato's Republic. Not the Bible. The Bible teaches private property. It's not an absolute private property per se. It's not monopoly capitalism, but there is the idea of the rights of an individual and the rights of property and so forth in Mosaic law, biblical law, and that would go on to inform uh, a lot of later legal theory, especially as we get into common law, Roman law, combining together with common law to kind of be the basics of Western uh, legal theory, as well as canon law. A lot of people don't know that uh, canon law, actually the Inquisition, the history of the Inquisition in the West uh, and the procedural um, legal theories behind inqu inquisitorial procedures. I'm not joking. That was actually a big influence on West Western legal theory. M many people don't know this, right? But uh, before the Protestant Reformation, there were there was legal theorists, there were lawyers, and there was law. So, uh, you know, idiot Protestants might not know this, but that's the case. And likewise, uh, just to do the sort of sweeping claim that Marxism comes out of the Old Testament is completely dumb so we're not dealing with a an extremely knowledgeable opponent here to put it nicely <laughs> um uh the baha'i religion for example things like that now with this understanding it is important to understand that when we speak about jesus as a person there are really two separate traditions as far as interpreting who Jesus is. There is indeed the Abrahamic tradition, that is the tradition that's based upon Old Testament, but then there is the Dharmic tradition and the Dharmic understanding of who is Jesus and what are his teachings. What we've seen with Christianity, as opposed to, let's say, Judaism or, or Islam, which are purely 100% Abrahamic, what we've seen with Christianity, on the other hand, is that Christianity has never been 100% Abrahamic. Indeed, throughout the 2,000-year-old history of Christianity, we have seen a tension that was there within Christian culture and theology between, on the one hand, yes, indeed, a very large degree of Abrahamic influence. And we see this especially uh, theologically as far as church doctrine, church organization, et cetera, et cetera. But then we have also seen that there has been a very pronounced, if more quiet, stream that is actually Dharmic. And we see this not so much even in the religion itself, but again, in the person of Jesus. In the person of Jesus. What we see is that there has been this tension between Constantinian Christianity, that is the Christianity of Constantine, which is indeed quite Abrahamic and which has led to the form of mainstream Christianity that we see today versus what some people call the more mystical elements of Christianity. So what's interesting is that uh, the, he's, it's almost like he's borrowing some of these uh, Protestant fundamentalist arguments, obviously, right? This is a typical Baptist or Seventh-day Adventist argument 
that Constantine really changed stuff. Uh, we hear Muslims make this argument. Um, nobody who has an, a, a basic knowledge of the writings of Irenaeus, of Clement, of Ignatius, of even Tertullian, who's a heretic, but still historically relevant, of Cyprian, of Alexander, of Theophilus, of Athanasius, because he's at the time of Nicaea. Nobody who has a knowledge of these church fathers, Ambrose, would think that there is a radical difference after Nicaea. This is a just ignorantly repeated idea. It's, it's spouted every day, especially on YouTube, over and over and over by all the people in these goofy sects. And the... Uh, the assumption is that we all know that Constantine basically changed the religion. Now, this guy's saying, well, he didn't significantly change it to the point that it wasn't uh, Abrahamic, right? But there's a tension between the mystical and what Constantine sets up. Now, remember, as we say, uh, excuse me, what is the evidence for this claim? Okay, what is the actual evidence before there being attention between Constantine's Abrahamic state religion and the mystic tradition. Does he mean monastics? Because St. Athanasius, uh, if I recall, at least thought highly of St. Anthony. Does he mean, what does he mean? Is he talking about Gnostics? He never says, he just sort of says these things as if they're givens and that's not how a debate or a challenge or, or a critique of a position works. You can't just fly by these things. Oh, well, we all know that, you know, it's like uh, the Trinity create at, at uh, Nicaea. Constantine create Trinity. Okay, and you say, what's the, what's the basis for that? No one teach Trinity. Jesus said God alone good. No, no, these are all terrible arguments. <laughs> okay, there's a lot more than those things. There's all of these other books, all these other writings, all these other church fathers just talk about the, the sun being God. Okay, Ignatius talks about the sun being God. Justin Martyr talks about the sun being God. In fact, Justin Martyr has a whole apologetic against Trifo the Jew showing Jesus in the Old Testament as the Logos, as the angel of the Lord, as the second person of Godhead. So, again, these are all just terrible arguments and they're all always based on they're just just people just repeat they think that if you repeat the same error over and over and over it just becomes uh, uh, well we all know that kind of thing we now know or we all know right in some cases Gnosticism uh, no Tertullian was not a Manichaean Tertullian became a Montanist Tertullian was a Catholic an Orthodox Catholic and then fell away into the heresy of Montanism, which was the charismatic Pentecostal heresy of its day. Montanists said he was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, shows that there was already belief in the personhood of the Holy Spirit, uh, right, in that, at that time. And you can find uh, you know, references to the deity of the Holy Spirit as well, prior to Basil and the Cappadocians defending the deity of the Holy Spirit. But... Regardless, the point is that, yes, the Trinitarian doctrine is true and is believed even before the word Trinity is used, right? Because it's not a matter of having to, the, to know the precise, perfect term. As St. Jerome says, we don't worship words. We're concerned with what the words signify, you see. So let's get back to his argumentation here. And we're going to show, we're going to show, by the way, that uh, for Paul... You know, it's crucial to his apologetic, to his approach, that Jesus is in perfect conformity with Abraham. In fact, Abraham had the gospel preached to him, Paul will say. Paul says it in Romans 4, he says in Galatians 4, uh, it comes up in Hebrews 4. So remember, if you're looking for places to demonstrate to people that have these, these uh, heterodox, weird views and assu false assumptions, that there was something different going on with Abraham then with what was going on with Jesus, oh, well, then why does Jesus say in John 8, before Abraham was, I am? Why does Paul say in Romans 4 that the gospel is preached to Abraham? 
The gospel was preached to Abraham, Galatians 4. The gospel was preached to the Jews in the wilderness, Hebrews 4. Remember the fours. John 8 and then the fours. Because all those texts show the continuity between the Old and the New Testament. Now, does continuity between the Old and the New Testament mean that the relationship between the Old and the New Testament is identical? No. There is a change. There is a, a difference, a significance that relates to the incarnation of the second person of the Godhead. And we'll get to that in a moment, but um, just remember that this whole position is going to be essentially premised on the presupposition of a false dialectic between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's going to be a repeat of the heresies of Marcion and the Gnostics. That's their whole position is premised on those very things. In other cases, oh, just various uh, Christian saints who truly did try their best to follow in the actual footsteps of Jesus, etc. So again, there's always been that that tension that's been there. As far as Jesus himself, it is very, very important to understand that Jesus himself was indeed not a, an Abrahamist. For that matter, and I always have to point this out to people, Jesus was not Christian. Jesus did not come here to either fulfill the, let's say, older religion of the Old Testament, but neither did he come here to establish a new religion either. The idea of quote-unquote Christianity is something that came about after Jesus left this world. Again, Jesus did not come here to start a new religion, but then for that matter, he did. Okay, uh, pfft, all right, everybody here is like, you know, face palming at this point, right? Because nobody could actually say this without just being totally ignorant of the Bible, right? I mean, particularly being totally ignorant of something like the Messianic prophecies, okay? So we have dozens and dozens of Messianic prophecies, right? And the Messianic prophecies um, tell us that the whole Old Testament <laughs> is about Jesus fulfilling what was written before. As you guys know, we did the uh, lecture through the entire Gospel of John. We covered that point over and over and over, especially John 5. What does Jesus say in John 5? Right? Moses was writing about me. No man sees the Father. Moses saw me, Jesus is saying. On Mount Sinai, Jesus is saying, Moses saw me, Jesus, on Mount Sinai. That's why the Jews are enraged in John 5. And Jesus makes it very clear that that's what he's saying and that's what he's talking about. So right away, and by the way, this guy will cite the Gospel of John. So he accepts the Gospel of John. He never gives a reason or a basis or an argument for why the chapters that he cites are, are authentic. But any chapters that we would cite, I'm sure he'll say, well, we don't know that those are the actual words of Jesus. Except that when you cite it, in, you know, when you cite John 6 and John 9 or whatever he cites, they're the words of Jesus, according to you. Do you see this? And every one of these cult leaders, every one of these sects, every one of these heterodox people in these cults, they do this exact same thing. Remember, remember Mike? Remember Mike from Urantia? Mike did the same thing. He did the exact same thing that the Muslims do. He, he says, oh, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse, this verse in the New Testament, those are all good. And that, those are authentic. Then I say, well, your reading of those verses is wrong because of this, 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 this. And he says, yeah, but your verses are corrupted. I mean, dude, come on. Anybody with an IQ over like 90 can recognize that he, that doesn't work. Dude, do you understand? Like that's, that's foul. So you can't do that. Uh, or you need to demonstrate if that is the case, you need them, but they don't, they're not ever going to demonstrate it because it's not true. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't actually have a basis or an argument by which to know that that is the case, that these verses don't work. They're bogus. They're inserted later. They're just speaking out of their butt. Dude. They're, they're guru sizing out of their butt. Just like the, the cult people. And just like the Muslims, right? By the way, yes, thank you. If you would, nerds, uh, please hit like and share.
and we will take the uh, super test later. But let's uh, we got to hit on this first one because Jesus didn't come to fulfill the Old Testament, and he didn't come to set up a church or Christianity. Now, most of the time when people make this argument, they're literally making an argument that is so low IQ that they think that, well, the, the proof for Jesus not setting up Christianity is that the New Testament doesn't say, I have come to set up Christianity. Dude, first of all, on what basis do you tell us <laughs> what the presuppositions of our religion are or what the, the necessary and sufficient conditions are for our belief system, right? So you're assuming that we can only believe what's in the biblical text. Okay, we don't believe that. Nor did Jews, by the way. Jews didn't believe in Sola Scriptura. We don't believe in Sola Scriptura. So you can't assume that there has to be this specific literal like phraseology in the Bible or else we can't believe it and this is so dumb that and, and easy to refute we can just simply point out that the Bible doesn't tell you the books of the Bible the Bible is known by tradition so no the Bible doesn't have to say I have come to set up the religion Christianity as if that's the only way to know that Jesus set up the religion. I mean, this is so stupid, right? This is just like a like a really low tier argument. Um, but what does Jesus say at the end of Luke, right? Because this is completely relevant to whatever nonsense this guy's talking about. And we covered this in the Gospel of John. If you listen to the the John lectures, right? But Jesus says at the end of Luke. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things that were written must be fulfilled in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then Jesus opened their eyes to understand the scriptures. Did you hear me? Jesus is telling the apostles, and there's no Bible at this time, it's the Old Testament. All things are fulfilled by me because all the things that were written before were about me. In Moses, that's all five books. The prophets, that's the major and minor prophets for people that don't know. And the Psalms, David's and the others prophetic Psalms. They're all about Jesus. And we've gone through the Psalms. If you read the Psalter, anybody who reads the Psalter regularly, like Orthodox monastics and bishops do, you know that the Psalter consistently teaches the death, burial, resurrection, a descent of Christ into Hades, excuse me, descent and then resurrection. Over and over and over. It's a, it's a obvious pattern throughout the Psalms, as well as dozens of predictions of the Gentile church. When the Messiah comes, the Gentiles will convert. When you see a Gentile church, then you know the Messiah has come. That's the kingdom. Over and over and over and over and over. Hence, Romans 15 cites two or three Psalms where David uh, Paul says, you are, you, church in Rome, are the fulfillment of what David was saying in the Psalms when he predicted Jews and Gentiles worshiping Yahweh together as a fulfillment of the prophecies. Now, this is why Biblical knowledge is so important. In order to refute goobers and heretics like this, you have to know the Bible. You have to know the Old Testament. You have to know what's in Ezekiel. You have to know what's in Zechariah. You have to know what's in the Psalms. You have to know what's in Deuteronomy. You have to know what's in Numbers, Genesis, Exodus. You got to know these things. And the people that fall for this guy or other Neo-pagan, Gnostic, they don't know. People are totally ignorant of the Bible. It's, it's kind of amazing, actually. Now, I'm not being Protestant here because I'm not saying that all you need is the Bible. Right? The Protestant mistake. I just, just me and my Bible, dog. It's just me and my Bible and my Bible church. Right? And they're not, not saying that. But the primary source of our revealed doctrines is Scripture. And there is a primacy to the scriptural texts working in concert with 
the traditions, the oral traditions, the liturgical traditions, ecclesiastical traditions, all holding this together, you see. So it's not an either or Bible versus tradition because there are good and bad traditions. Jesus in the gospel appeals to non-textual, non-canonical traditions. So when Jesus says in Matthew 23 that the scribes and Pharisees are bad guys, it's in that very chapter that he appeals to non-canonical tradition. He says the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, Episcopate, Cathedra of Moses. There's no seat of Moses in the Old Testament. There's no idea of Moses Stolic succession that scribes and Pharisees have. It's a tradition, and Jesus affirms that as a correct tradition. Jesus says, The scribes and the Pharisees have the legitimate authority. Do what they say, don't do as they do. That's a tradition. And the Bible in many places references traditions. So there's nothing wrong with traditions. When Jesus is rebuking things, he's talking about traditions that replace or subvert God's word. And God's word is not only written. When Paul says to Timothy, you heard the word of God from me three years, night and day in Ephesus. You heard the word. That's oral. Some of it's written down. Some of it's oral. So this person is, first of all, totally unaware and the easiest way to go about refuting these people is to start saying, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. How are there all of these messianic prophecies? This is where evidences and evidentialism and the evidence of biblical texts and prophecies comes to, into play. Now, if we want to go the philosophical route, if we wanted to critique this guy in a tag way, you can do that. Perfectly okay to do that. But this guy has gone to the text and so here it might be more advantageous to move into the text themselves and to refute this guy in the text that he's trying to use. And then perhaps kind of like come back around and whop, hit that dude with a tag argument to ultimately melt this position. So super chats were disabled uh, about a year ago. So if you want to super chat, you can still do that, but you have to do it through Streamlabs. So it's the same thing, same process. And by the way, uh, no percentage gets taken out. So you can super chat right there through the Streamlabs link and it will pop up. As you can see, John was the last guy. Boom. If you do that, it pops up in your comment. And I'll read your comment in a little bit. But so uh, back to the text here. So remember, the whole book of Hebrews refutes this dude. This dude says Jesus didn't come. To fulfill this Old Testament religion. The whole book of Hebrews is written to show that Jesus fulfills a role superior to the angels in Hebrews 1. He's fully human in Hebrews 2. So Hebrews 1 talks about his divinity. He's superior to the angels because he's the son of God. Hebrews 2, right, that goes into being tempted, his humanity, if I recall. Hebrews 3, 4 moves into the Sabbath, the symbolism of the Sabbath. Hebrews 5, 6, 7, we get into the priesthood, the temple, Melchizedek, the high priest, the Levitical ceremonies, all prefiguring the work of Christ. So this guy, no idea what he's talking about. The whole book of Hebrews, you see, is an exposition of, on what we just read in Luke 24. Luke 24 said, all that stuff is about me. So Hebrews is like an exposition of Luke 24, 44, and 45. So what is this guy talking about? Jesus didn't come to fulfill the Old Testament? <laughs> what? Now, he's going to go on to say, and by the way, Jesus teaches a different religion than the Old Testament. Again, he tries to cite the Gospels to prove this. But he, and he just picks like a couple of verses that maybe he remembers from hearing something at some Protestant church or something. 
But Jesus says, if, if everybody knows the Sermon on the Mount, right? Do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I do not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then he goes on to say, whoever teaches against the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever teaches and observes them will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, I'm not here to get rid of Moses and the prophets and the law. He says, even the least of the commandments in the Old Testament still have an application today. So, it was like literally the opposite of what this guy's saying. He did not come here to quote unquote reform Judaism either. Rather, what Jesus did was indeed in his own way, given his audience, the fact that his audience really were not individuals who were very conversant with Dharma in any way whatsoever, really. What he attempted to do was to teach Dharma within the context of the culture of the Levant, what we would call Palestine, and this Old Testament culture. He attempted to teach Dharma in every way. But what we have seen is that of... Now, it would be interesting if this guy actually defined it, but he never did. So it's probably, oh, it's a mystical thing. You can't define it. So look, I can't, I can't tell you until you experience it. But uh, Jesus really deeply, truly taught it in its you know, secret way. But uh, what he had said earlier was that this related to an inner, he said something like the an inner life that Jesus had or an inner presence or something, something like that, right, that Jesus had and that he's trying to really just express it to uh, this, you know, primitive culture or whatever. Now, the irony is that this primitive culture of the Levant, supposedly, that Jesus is having to, you know, step down and condescend to explain Dharma to, is the religion, the culture that rejects the worshiping of cattle, which this dude's country of India still has the, the cow worship, which is like the golden calf worship. I mean, I think there's an argument to be made here that India has preserved, right, that golden calf worship, whatever form that was, at least at the time of Moses' exodus, appears to have gone on into, right, the brahmic tradition or whatever the, the the tradition of india so i mean why do they worship a cow right um so you have millions of people in abject just poverty and degradation starving with animals walking around and they're drinking its pee and bathing in it okay so this is this is what this guy thinks is a superior culture to the religion that is saying that's dumb, dude. That, of course, Jesus himself was indeed not an Abrahamist. Jesus himself was not really a follower of the Old Testament. Again, what did we just read? Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. Moses wrote about me, was not a follower of the Old Testament. So, again, we went through the entire Gospel of John, and we saw that every chapter of the Gospel of John show that Christ is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the Passover, John 3. He is the Logos co-creator with God the Father in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He created the world. He's not created because he is God, but he is the creator God, and he's assigned and given the title of creator, the same power as the Father. As St. Basil says, this, uh, uh, whatever or whoever has the same energy possesses the same nature. So if the father has the same energy and power as the son, then they possess the same nature. Likewise, Basil says for the Holy Spirit. So if the son is a creator, then he possesses the same nature and power as the father to create. And so therefore he possesses the same divinity. He's equal in divinity to the father. In John 1. In John 3, he is the fulfillment of the Passover. And he is the serpent lifted up on a pole from Numbers. 
In John 6, he's the fulfillment of the wandering in the wilderness, the manna from heaven. In John 4, he's the well of water. And you know from Ezekiel that that dry bones, that well of water, which is the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel, that Ezekiel text is being referred to in John 4 as well as other Old Testament texts, right? Because remember, the Holy Spirit is mentioned multiple times throughout the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is not an invention in the New Testament. Multiple places. We, we just did the talk on Ezekiel. Holy Spirit comes up in Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I think, 8, 9, 10. Father, Son, and Spirit in all those chapters. So let's remember... Trinity is not invented at Nicaea. Trinity is not made up by Paul. Father, Son, and Spirit in Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And later on, Valley of the Dry Bones chapter, Zechariah 1, 2, 3, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's in Numbers. Holy Spirit's in Exodus. Exodus 24. I saw the form of God standing there on the sapphire floor. Who is that? One like a son of man. Who did they eat with? Who did Moses and the elders eat with? One like a son of man. Wonder who that is. Dude, it's clear as day who it is. Come on. So this guy, totally ignorant. Now, why is he totally ignorant? Now, on the one hand, it's okay. Well, he hasn't read the text. But remember, it's not a matter of just reading the text. We're not Protestants, right? We don't think, well, the text means what it says and it says what it means. Texts require interpretation. There's no such thing as a non-theory-laden, a priori, self-evident meaning of a text. Texts come with a context. They come within a milieu, a paradigm. And in fact, that paradigm is not just reading a bunch of other books. Jesus had said that he opened the mind of the disciples to understand the scriptures. Without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the scriptures. Literally, Paul says the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit. So people in delusion, people in prelust can't understand. They don't know what you're talking about. They can't do it until they have repentance, grace, illumination, noetic, direct experience. So the, the cleansing of the news has to occur for them to be able to not be subject to the passions and the delusions. And again, I'm not saying, oh, you just go read the Bible and you, you're, you're cool. No, it's the context, the milieu, and the context is the entire experience of the Orthodox Church. Okay? Liturgy, sacraments, repentance. Again, what did Basil say if you listen to the lecture in Montana? Basil says to Eunomius, your problem is not you haven't read enough books. The problem is you are reading the books as if you can have a direct knowledge of God from books, but you haven't repented. So he says, Eunomius' problem is spiritual delusion. And hence he can't understand. And ironically, and I'm not trying to be rude, but I mean, we see it every day. We see the people who are in delusion. They can't understand what you're saying. They trip up on the words. Basil actually makes fun of Eunomius for word concept fallacy and tripping up thinking words have the same meaning, right? They have a uh, uh, mono uh, systemic meaning from one system to another. They're, that He doesn't understand that words are polyvalent. They have multiple layers and levels and senses. Uh, but people who don't know philosophy, they don't know theology, they're not trained in any of those things relating to predication, naming, they commit the word concept fallacy all the time. And especially heretics. Heretics are always tripped up by word concept fallacy. How do we know this? Well, in many ways. <laughs> all you have to do is indeed read the teachings of Jesus, read the stories of what happened to him. Okay, so his argument is, how do we know that Jesus is teaching a different doctrine in the Old Testament? Well, all you have to do is read it. I mean, this guy's like 
Protestant, low level Protestant tier argumentation. Um, I just read you multiple things that refute his uh, stupid characterization, which is just false. I mean, remember when we talk about messianic prophecies, right? This is another way to demonstrate that the the harmony and continuity of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, because the Old Testament is about Christ everywhere. Genesis one, Adam is a type of Christ, according to Paul in Corinthians. First Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, right? Recapitulation of Christ, according to Paul, also in Colossians, Ephesians, because he's the new, the second Adam. He recapitulates everything Adam lost. Genesis three, the proto-evangelium, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's what happened at the cross. That's the proto-evangelium, the gospel preached beforehand in Genesis three. Um, Genesis 12, 5, 17, 22, the Abrahamic covenant. Everything going on in the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant in Christ. It's Christ speaking to, present with Abraham, making the covenant with Abraham, preparing Abraham and his seed for Christ to become incarnate to then open up that covenant to all the nations. That's what Galatians 3 and 4 says, and Romans 4. Romans 5, Christ is the new Adam. Melchizedek, right? What's Melchizedek doing? He brings out bread and wine. He's a type of Christ. All these types are prophetic and apologetic. Exodus 32, Exodus 3. I will put the, my name in that angel. The angel of the Lord is the same one speaking in Exodus 3 in the burning bush. The burning bush is the same as the angel of the Lord who goes before the Israelites into the promised land. And he has the name of Yahweh. What does Yahweh say? I will give my name to no one else. Oh, but wait a minute. The angel has his name because it's not a created angel. Angel just means messenger. It's the messenger of the covenant, the messenger of the Lord. It's Jesus. So who is standing on the sapphire floor who has the throne chariot in Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, 4? One like a son of man. I saw the form of God, Moses says, standing there on the sapphire floor. And I went up on the mountain and ate with him. How do you eat with God? Oh, because it's the Son of God. Because Jesus says, no man sees the Father at any time. There's no bodily form to the Father. So who is this angel of the Lord identified as God, as the wonderful named one in Judges 13 to Manoah, Samson's parents? Who is this wonderful one? Isaiah says, wonderful counselor, mighty God. A child is born unto us. Emmanuel, God with us. What does Luke say? He's Emmanuel, God with us. Mary's prayer, the Magnificat, the beginning of Luke, is the fulfillment. It's almost exactly what Hannah prays in Samuel. Go read Hannah's prayer. Compare it to the Magnificat. This is a type. Type, fulfillment. Type, fulfillment. Hannah is a type of Mary. Mary is a fulfillment. Hannah's prayer, Magnificat. They're obviously, perfectly in harmony. Mary is a new Eve. Eve is a type of Mary, the mother of all living. Apocalypse 12, Mary is the mother of all of those seed that come from her son, from Mother Church. Galatians 4, our mother is the Jerusalem of above, the heavenly Jerusalem, Mother Church. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Galatians 1. Paul has the same pattern and principle as Deuteronomy 18, 15. That what he's delivering is the exact same principle and pattern 
of the prophetic word of God in Deuteronomy. Paul is in perfect continuity with Deuteronomy. Paul, in fact, cites Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all of these texts in his epistles. When he says a woman shouldn't teach, as the law says, Paul cites law to prove his moral principles. I do not permit a woman to teach, as the law says. Anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed, Deuteronomy 21, 21 to 22. That's Jesus. We perceive him as accursed, the Psalms say. I wrote a whole essay on Elijah. The life of Elijah is a perfect mirror to the prophetic ministry of Christ. Elijah is a phenomenal type of Christ. And if you're too lazy to read, I have a video. You can go watch the video, lazies. So how is all of this? Here it is. Here's the Elijah video. How is all of this teaching Jesus, but Jesus isn't connected to the Old Testament? How does Jesus cite the Old Testament? Jesus says Adam and Eve were joined in marriage. What God has joined, let no man tear asunder. Jesus appeals to Genesis. So this guy is totally wacko. him and you see that all throughout his ministry all throughout the time that he was preaching he was always at odds with the religious leaders of his time that is the religious the religious leaders of Judaism at the time that is the religious leaders who were following the Old Testament they recognized in Jesus and again all you need to do to see the evidence of this is read the Gospels they recognized in Jesus someone who was opposed to to their religious doctrines. And he showed this again and again and again in his teachings, in not following the Sabbath, in indeed doing work on the Sabbath and being chastised by the Pharisees, etc. So this is, again, a fundamental mistake because Jesus is not chastised because he, in fact, is breaking the Sabbath. Jesus retorts by saying, no, no, doing good works on the Sabbath is permissible in fact it's what you should do on the sabbath so in fact jesus was not breaking the sabbath so this guy just assumes that the pharisees were right and that because jesus opposed them right that jesus didn't follow the old testament but the pharisees had accrued all of these traditions and because jesus trumps the authority of the pharisees he's able to correct them you see the greater corrects the lesser not the other way around why? Because Jesus is who gave the law. James says there is one lawgiver, and he's talking about Jesus. Jesus gave the law at Mount Sinai. Jesus says, I spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai in John 5. That's what he's saying. That's the argument of John 5. So this goober doesn't even know that Jesus is who gave the law. Jesus is who gave Deut Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Exodus. Jesus is who's standing in Exodus 24 on top of the mountain in the chariot on the chair on the sapphire floor the chariot throne that's Jesus but this guy doesn't know any of that he has no idea about that he doesn't know that it's the same God of the Old and New Testament his position pr is premised on there being a dichotomy between this God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament but he never proves this he doesn't show this he's using the example of Jesus fighting the Pharisees uh, that doesn't prove that it's a different God of the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus cites the Old Testament to prove that he's right. Etc. Et what we also see is that Jesus was even worshiping a different being from the Abrahamists of his time. These Abrahamists were indeed worshiping Yahweh. They were your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Moses wrote about me, for Moses wrote about me, and the scripture cannot be broken. Moses wrote about me. Didn't we just go through the Gospel of John? Has this guy ever read the Gospel of John? Because he keeps saying, just read it. 
If you just read the stories, you'll see Jesus is teaching a different gospel, a different God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And in him there was no darkness at all. It's a it's a uh, reference back to Genesis 1. Right? John 1 is playing on Genesis 1 with the creation, the created light in Genesis 1, the uncreated light in John 1. Jesus is the uncreated light, right? In that he possesses the same divinity because he is the glory of the Father in Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the Son is identified as the second person of the Godhead, a divine person in John 1. And in fact, as John progresses, he says that he's eternally in the bosom of the Father because he's eternally begotten of the Father. John 1 teaches the eternal begetting of the Son, right? The Son eternally proceeds in a generation from the Father's nature, and hence he is the Father's direct offspring. He doesn't proceed from some generic nature, from the Father's nature. And the Father communicates his nature and all those powers to the Son. All that the Father has, he has given to me, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. Hence, Jesus is the eternally begotten Son. And all of these Old Testament texts that we've shown you about the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the covenant, who is called Yahweh in Malachi, is Jesus. Thus, the theophany that we see, the Trinitarian revelation that we see at Jesus' baptism, is no different than the theophany in Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, 4. Trinitarian theophany. So this idea that it's a different God is just ludicrous and is just over and over and over again obviously refuted. Jesus is constantly saying that the God who spoke to Moses is my God, God the Father, and that his job, his duty is to say and do whatever the Father tells him to do to call these people back to the worship of God the Father. And God the Father is identified all throughout the Gospels as the God of the Old Testament, the God who gave the law to Moses. Who does Peter say is speaking through David and Moses and Ezekiel and Isaiah? The Spirit of Christ who spake through the prophets. It's the Spirit of Christ speaking through Isaiah and Ezekiel. Anybody who's read Isaiah knows that it's the fifth gospel. Why is Isaiah the fifth gospel? The mere fact that Isaiah is the fifth gospel refutes everything this guy is saying we're worshiping this localized desert metaphysical being who we find throughout the totality of the old testament who has its own characteristics but this was not what jesus taught as far as the nature of god now this is something we hear the pagans and these kind of people saying all the time the localized desert god uh, i mean very early on in genesis you have the claims that he is the God of the whole world. Okay, Genesis 1, he's the creator of the whole universe. So, I understand that you don't believe that, but the texts don't identify him as a localized desert God. I understand many of the pagans and these people, they, they think that that's the case. But this guy's appealing to the text. Remember, he's going to the Gospel of John, so he thinks he believes these texts. And he's got some, in, some secret gnosis way to interpret these texts. But in fact, that's not the case. The texts themselves refer to Genesis 1, as we just saw in the Gospel of John. So remember, this guy is going to cite the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John in John 1 begins by citing Genesis. And it identifies Jesus as the co-creator with the Father in John 1, referring to Genesis 1. So the mere fact that this guy cites the Gospel of John refutes his dumb claim that this is a localized desert deity. Ah, then this was not the being who he worshipped. Rather, the God who Jesus worshipped 
was a radically different be being from what was followed in the Old what, Testament. And where's the argument? What was this? portrayed in the Old Testament? Where's the argument? Of this? The God of Jesus represented a, br a complete break theologically from Old Testament Judaism. And this was a being, this was a God who, rather than being harsh, rather than being angry, rather than being jealous, rather than asking that we fear him, this was a God who Jesus worshipped, who was the very opposite. Do not fear him who can kill body and soul, but rather fear him who is able to throw both body and soul Excuse me, don't fear him who is able to kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to kill both body and soul into hell. <laughs> I mean, uh, do not uh, hastily call people names or else you will be liable to the judgment. Uh, this people who has rejected me, Matthew 23, 22, 23, they will be cast into the outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The wrath of the Lamb, Apocalypse. What is this guy talking about? So he's playing on the average normie perception that Jesus was this guy who walked around and talked about love. Okay. And every normie, every like liberal, every hippie, every just kind of average dude out there thinks that. Jesus, like, he taught like love or whatever, right? Like love people and just you know like be cool with stuff and like he never condemned people, right? I mean, really? John seven twenty four, judge with the righteous judgment. On whomever this stone falls, you will be crushed and ground to powder. But you will receive the greater damnation. Because you say we see you are still in your sins and you will die in your sins because you do not believe that I am he. In the gospel of John, the love gospel. Jesus talks about hell all throughout the gospel of John and condemnation for those who don't believe. This is just ignorance and it's just totally wrong. I mean, and we don't have to go to Paul's epistles. I mean, everybody knows that Paul pretty consistently teaches that right, there's condemnation for those who don't believe, who, re, who you know, reject all this. So there you go. Who was a God of love? Who was a God who asked us merely to surrender to him? So again, and I can go on and on. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't say that God is only love, right? It says God is love, but God is also just. God is also... Um, he chastises those that he loves. Right? And guess what? Lex talionis, eye for eye, is actually continued in the New Testament. There's multiple places in the New Testament where lex talionis is referred to. Such as, render unto those right who have persecuted your saints on the earth, O Lord. The prayers of the saints under the altar, the martyrs who pray for vengeance on those on the earth who persecute the church. Render unto them vengeance, O Lord. Eye for an eye, lex talionis. God didn't change things. Oh, I was mean back then, and now I love you. No, it's the exact same. There is a difference of emphasis in that the Old Testament was a pedagogical period where there's a focus on simple things. Don't commit idolatry. Don't do these things. Here's a liturgical worship to help direct you away from those idolatrous practices. Preparing the way for the more simplified universal worship of the church, bread, wine, water, oil, easily accessible things, which now replaces all this myriad of complicated ceremonies, right? Which in principle are still kept. All the sacrificial dietary laws, those things in principle are kept and we see this in the way that Paul describes the spiritual principle behind the dietary food land laws. Don't sow two seeds in one field. Paul says that means don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship had light with darkness? Don't sow two different types of cloth onto the same cloth. Seems like an irrational law. No, Paul says it's a type of good and evil can't be mixed together. 
So, again, the spiritual application of even the ceremonial laws is still in effect in Paul's epistles. Uh, again, I don't need to take a look at the New Testament and you'll see how the religious leaders, the Abrahamic religious leaders of his day, could not understand what Jesus was doing and they saw him as a radical threat to the point of killing. The other, the, the other thing that's ironic about this talk is that he never actually goes into what he thinks Abrahamism is. Now, sometimes people think, oh, well, it's uh, just monotheism. Really? I mean, monotheism is a word that's very late in the game, as Dr. Bo Branson has demonstrated. So nobody in the time of Moses, Abraham, or even in the church fathers is using consistently this word monotheism. Now, it's eventually it's used, yeah. But the monotheism is the monoarche of the Father. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth. So the principal source of unity and the reason for we, us believing in one God is God the Father. Does that mean that God the Father is the only reference point for our worship? No, because God the Father has any, because he's eternally the Father, has eternally a son, God the Son. And there's also the Holy Spirit. So this is a revelation. Right? It's revealed theology, revealed faith. And the Holy Spirit directs us to the Son who directs us to the Father. That's that triadic principle that Basil talked about so often. From the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. So, when he talks about the Old Testament being this other kind of religion that's mean and cruel, it is totally a characterization and not at all based on any kind of biblical knowledge at all now what does this say for those individuals who uh believe that jesus was just a continuation of indeed abrahamism and the old testament that he wasn't really doing anything new what does this say that again throughout the totality of the stories of jesus all the religious leaders were not only opposed to his teachings and what he was doing but to the point of literally killing him Interestingly, he was recognized as a religious... Uh, is he unaware that the very texts themselves predict that he would be killed? I mean, I couldn't think of a stronger proof that this is the correct religion than dozens of prophecies that even include him being killed. Okay? The Psalms, which are cited in the Gospels. I mean, and as you know, right, David's Psalms consistently refer to that that motif of David praying in the spirit, he's persecuted, he's put to death, or he feels like he's being put to death, it's because David is speaking in the spirit of Christ, it's predicting the death, burial, and resurrection. David says, it feels like I'm going down to Hades. And then he prays, and you have vindicated me, right? You have raised me up over and over and over and over and over. Psalm 110, right? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Psalm 110 is cited multiple times in the New Testament about the ascension of Christ. And it's the ascension of Christ by the Father hearing his prayer and raising him from the dead in that human nature that underwent death, right? So the Son of God underwent death by the human soul being severed from the human body. So this is predicted in tons of psalms. If it's predicted in tons of psalms, then it's not a different religion from the Old Testament. It's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And all of these dozens and dozens and dozens, dozens prophecies and types and predictions, even to the precision point, Daniel 9, of it being under the Roman Empire and that when he comes and dies it will remove the temple Daniel 9 24 5 6 7 predicts this in fact it's such a precise prediction that rabbinical Jews pronounce a curse on Christians who read it because it's so obvious
So, I mean, this is so bad, right? This, this argumentation here is just so low tier. Religious leader in his own right. He was recognized as an individual who was close to God in his own right. To take the life of such a person is not something that would have been done very lightly just because you have some little theological disagreement or something like that. Regardless of the religion involved. The reason that they put him to death is because he claims to be the son of God. Uh, this guy will cite the Gospel of John. He apparently has no knowledge of the Gospel of John because that's the chief thrust of the whole Gospel is Jesus continually claiming and proclaiming his deity and saying he's the son of God. And then the Pharisees become enraged and they want to stone him and kill him. So his very question is actually answered in the gospel that he cites, but he hasn't read it. Well, there's always some little theological disagreement, and you simply debate it. Yeah, but claiming to be the Son of God is not a, a small disagreement. Etc. You kind of theologically denounce each other. But to take that ultimate step of finding someone to be such a threat to your worldview that you will quite literally kill the person and in the most horrific of ways imaginable. This is what shows us that indeed, Jesus was not an Abrahamist. He was a follower of Dharma. So again, um, has this person not even looked at what the Abrahamic covenants are? Does, it, does no one know? Do, do people not know? The pagans, the, 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 Jew, the, 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 the Jews at least know. Muslims, sectarian weirdos, do they not know what's in Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22? Okay, that's the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, and it's made more than once. It's reaffirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed. Genesis 12 is the call and the promise. Okay, I'm going to bless your seed, Abraham, and your seed will bless all the families of the earth. And all the nations, like the sand of the seashore, are going to be blessed from your descendant. I wonder who the descendant of Abraham is that's going to bless all the Gentiles. I wonder. Like, who could it be? I wonder. It's just mm, so hard to figure out, even though there's like countless explanations of who it is. It's Jesus. Okay. Promise in 12. Follow me. Come out from your people, from these pagans. I will make you a great nation. And in your seed, all the families of the world will be blessed. Genesis 15, restatement. Friend of God, declared righteous. Paul cites in Romans 5, Genesis 15. He doesn't cite Genesis 12, which disproves sola fide. Genesis 17, circumcision given. A theophany. The Logos is present in the cloud and in the darkness, the same cloud and darkness that you see mentioned in the Psalms, the same cloud and darkness that appears to Ezekiel 1, 2, 3, 4, and 8, 9, 10. The glory cloud. I saw the glory of God, he says. It's the Son of Man, one like the Son of Man. Who, who cannot read Ezekiel and, and see this? <laughs> what is Ezekiel talking? Obviously, he's talking about the same thing as his Exodus 24 is talking about. Okay. So, remember, right? This is what's going on. And then, so Genesis 17, circumcision, you're going to do this, right? Paul says, explains the, the mystery of circumcision. All these people bring this up. It's explained in Colossians. Circumcision is a type of water baptism. It's not rocket science. It's clearly explained in Colossians what the significance of circ circumcision was. Was it a national covenant? Yeah, sure. But it was only for males. Okay. And it doesn't sound like a fun rite. So what did it signify? Inclusion in the covenant and the removal of the source of the original or ancestral sin. The male principle of generation. Paul explains as clear as day in Colossians 2 and 3 what the meaning and significance of circumcision is. He says it's the old man, it's Adam, 
and the generation of Adam being done away with. And it's a type of water baptism. So what circumcision typifies, water baptism does in reality. Hence, baptismal regeneration. It must be born of water and spirit. So what the Old Testament sacraments, you could say, signify, the New Testament sacra sacraments make real. Now, baptism is given to everyone. Women and men are included in the covenant. And even children. Because God always includes the children of his people in the covenant. He says in Corinthians that the unbelieving even is sanctified by the wife. And vice versa. doesn't mean they're baptized, but it means that they can be brought into a covenantal relationship. So, so this guy has no idea what he's talking about. So, all that being said, several things that I want to talk about. And one of these is how Jesus taught, indeed, something very different from the Abrahamists of his time. His concept of God was something very different. Also, his concept of ethics was also something that was very, very different. You know, we know for a fact... Okay. Again, we've done this many times. We did a whole uh, stream on this point of continuity, especially Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, appeals directly to Leviticus. Okay? The Old Testament didn't say that you have a right to hate people. Did you know that? A lot of people think this. They think that, oh, in the Old Testament, you could hate people. Uh, no. You shall not hate your neighbor in your heart. Where is that from? That's from the Old Testament. Did you know that? Okay. We always have to point this out because people are ignorant. They don't know what the texts actually say. Leviticus. Okay. Multiple texts. Leviticus 19, 16, 18, Proverbs 24, 33 to 34, Proverbs 20, verse 12. All those texts say, you can't hate your neighbor or your brother from your heart. You have to love them. Now, love doesn't mean that you do anything that they say and you let people walk all over you. No, you have the right to self-defense. You have all these rights. And nor does Jesus say, does he mean that give to somebody who, who you know, persecutes you everything that you have. He's not saying that you can never have recourse because in the New Testament, there's places where you have recourse. But it is a description of an attitude that if people are going to persecute you for righteousness sake, you should endure it. But there are limits to that. And the rest of the New Testament helps explain the limitations on that. All right. For example, like this is just a sentence. Protestants, oh, you, you shouldn't judge, dude. Oh, so Jesus is literally saying that nobody can be a judge, like as an office in their life. That's how silly these people are. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? When it says very clearly in Romans 13 that God has appointed all civil magistrates, rulers, and authorities, at least even in his, even the pagan ones in his providence rule. Okay. So obviously Jesus doesn't mean that you can't be a judge. He is talking about unrighteous judgment without a reason. John seven twenty four says judge with righteous judgment. So obviously do not judge is not in an unqualified sense. Okay. Obviously. But silly, ignorant, and unlearned people mess up with these things all the time. And this guy's doing that very thing where he thinks that Jesus is like teaching a different religion from the Pharisees because he's disagreeing with the Pharisees. But he doesn't understand that Jesus is above the Pharisees in authority. And he's saying, you are misinterpreting the law. He's correcting their misinterpreting of the law because he's the lawgiver. And it's not a battle over two different religions that when it comes to the Judaism of Jesus' time, 
these individuals indeed ethically, morally followed the Old Testament and very specifically, they followed the laws of Deuteronomy. They followed all of these over 600 laws that they considered to be sacrosanct. These include the kosher laws and various laws of human behavior, morality, etc., etc. Interestingly, these... What does Jesus say to the woman at the well? The woman at the well is a Samaritan. If you didn't know, Samaritans are the schismatics of that time. They didn't worship at the temple. They refused to. They relate. This goes back to Jeroboam and the uh, split of the of the northern and southern kingdoms and the creation of a fake state religion. This is where the Samaritans come from. And what does Jesus say to the woman of the well? He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is of the Jews. So all the dumb pagans and all the people like this guy and all the Marcionites, totally oblivious to this text, Jesus is saying, no, you, Samaritan woman, as a Samaritan, you are incorrect. Your system is an archetype of a schism. In fact, in the Orthodox liturgy, she is called the schismatic. Go listen to the liturgy on the day of the Samaritan woman. Now, does Jesus say, you're a schismatic and haha, ha, there's no hope for you, you're damned. No, he says, you need to listen to what we're saying. And in fact, she does repent and she becomes a believer in Christ. So this is a model of Jesus being the one who reconciles the schismatic. And that's what we should do. That's what we try to do. You know, we offer reconciliation all the time in the discord, even to schismatics, even to people who are wrapped up in really, really bad, not just schism, but really, really bad heresies. And really the woman at the well is a heretic too, because this, the Samaritans had some just ridiculous views. And, but Jesus is expressing as well, no, no, no. Salvation is of the Jews. It was a, obviously appointed throughout the Old Testament. This is an affirmation of Mosaic revelation. Salvation is of the Jews. It's not of the Samaritans. It's not from all these other sects. The only Orthodox Church of the Old Testament is the Jews. The only Orthodox Church of the New Testament is the Orthodox Church. These were not laws that Jesus himself stressed in any way whatsoever. Indeed, there are again... Anybody who teaches against the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So, false. In instances where he flaunts these laws, <laughs> where, for example, uh, according to uh, Abrahamic Judaism, one is not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus... Well, that's from the Mosaic law, but uh, in the passages where Jesus does good on the Sabbath... He rebukes the Pharisees by saying, if you circumcise a man on the Sabbath, which is a good work, then how much better to make him completely whole as I did in healing this man. So he didn't break the Sabbath. In fact, he taught them the real meaning of the Sabbath. So he is not flaunting the laws. He is fulfilling the laws and keep them, keeping them in the true sense because he's the one that gave the laws. Again, this guy's wrong. And remember what I said about the covenants. He keeps saying that this whole thing is against the Abrahamic covenant. What does Paul say about the Abrahamic covenant? Let's see. Now he says, Paul says, we are heirs, right? Sons of God. But a son, as long as he is a, as a, as he is a child, doesn't differ from the slave, even though he is master of all in, in potentia. But he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. So Paul's making an analogy to the Old Testament in that period being like a childish pedagogy until the time appointed by the Father to inherit. When the Son comes, Jesus the Son, who is the inheritor, then the sons of God inherit the fullness. That's the New Testament period. That's, that's what Paul's saying here. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage to the elements of the world. Right? He's talking about a baby being, you know, requiring all these things. And he's likening being a child and the, uh, the ultimate reliance that a child has on parents, right, for sustenance and so forth, to the way that the Old Testament period was for the Jews. Okay, It was like a childish period. 
But when the fullness of time comes, then God sends forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And by the way, that guy had said that Jesus taught against all the Jews and didn't, and that Jews didn't believe him. No, no, all of the early church are Pharisees and Jews and teachers of the law and simple believing people. The book of Acts is thousands of Jews converting for the first 10 chapters. So what, what is this guy talking about? Because you are sons, Paul says, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. Father, Son, Spirit, Trinitarian text right here. Note that. Therefore, you are no longer slaves. You're not under bondage to these simplistic uh, uh, base level pedagogy techniques of the law of Moses. You're now fully grown because you have the reality that those things signified. Why would you go back to the model when you have the house? Right? It would be like, uh, I built a small, you know, scale model of the house that I'm going to build. And instead of going to the house that I build, I just sit here staring at the scale model. That doesn't make any sense. It's dumb, right? And that's what Paul's saying. The Old Testament is the scale model. The reality has now come. Why would you go back to that? It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> but indeed, you were also to the Galatians. Now he's talking about them as pagans. He says, you were held under bondage to those things which were by nature not gods, right? So you worshiped the forces of nature and you thought they were gods, but they weren't gods, okay? But now you have known God, or rather you are known by God. And then how is it that you would then seek again the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? So there was at Galatia, we know, Judaizers. Paul is refute, refuting and rebuking the, the trend of Judaizing gentile converts and he's saying why would you go back to the things that were the types of the realities that you have now why would you want the map instead of the actual location it doesn't make any sense why would you want the model when you have the reality you observe the jewish days of feasts and seasons and years the jewish calendar he's talking about and i'm afraid for you he said, I'm afraid that I labored in vain. In other words, you're going to fall into this dumb heresy and all of my preaching and converting was a waste of time. But I want you to be like me. I want for you that I become like you. For you have not injured me at all. You know that because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first and my trial was in my flesh. And you did not despise or reject me. You received me as a messenger of God, even as Christ himself in persona Christi. Right? The minister is in the person of Christ. For I bear you witness. Uh, I'm going to skip down a little bit to where he gets to. Why do you desire to be under law? For it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and another by Oh, excuse me, uh, a free woman. For he that was born of the bondwoman, Ishmael, was subject to the bondage of the flesh. And he that was born of the free woman was subject to the promise, Isaac, the child of promise. Which things are a type or symbolic or an allegory, depending upon which text you're reading. So Paul is using Hagar and Sarah. And if you don't know the story, go read it because this is Abrahamism, duh which this guy never even explains. Abrahamism here is teaching us, the Abrahamic covenant, about two types of sons in the household of Abraham, God's household. Now, if you know the story, Abraham is and Sarah are having an issue because Sarah can't have a kid. So they're kind of doubting. They're like, eh, God's promised an heir, a, a descendant, but how, we, how is God going to fulfill all these promises when Sarah is barren. So then they get the idea, why don't we make it work? We're going to create our own works-based flesh system. We'll set it up. We'll do it our way. And we'll use Hagar, the servant woman, and I will impregnate the servant woman. And then we'll have an heir. And uh, we will make God's miraculous promises come to fruition through our own unbelieving works. 
And what happens? Ishmael is not the heir. God says, no, I did not tell you Ishmael. I told you the son of promise. So then God miraculously opens the womb of Sarah. Sarah is a type of Mary, a miraculous child born. Repeated pattern all throughout the Old Testament. Hannah, Sarah, miraculous child. Barren woman gives birth. Paul says that's a type of the church, Mary, the New Testament. Jesus is a miraculous birth. He is born of a miraculous birth, a spirit-based birth, not of the flesh, not of the works and power of human energy and pure humanity, but in fact a miraculous birth, meaning the Son of God in the womb of Mary, the Incarnation. Paul says these two things are a type. What's the type? Hagar and Ishmael represent earthly Jerusalem and the earthly temple. People trying to appease God by these childish pedagogical ceremonies, which ultimately are only pointing to the realities in the church. That's what he's arguing. He says, Hagar represents Mount Sinai and the fleshly Israelites of our day, in Paul's day, which corresponds to earthly Jerusalem, who is in bondage with her children. This is a striking claim. Wait a minute. Jews would say, we're the sons of Isaac. We're not sons of Ishmael. That's the, you know, Muslims or whoever, right? <laughs> Nowadays, not at this time, obviously. And Paul's saying, no, no, the real meaning of that text is that the Jerusalem above is Sarah, the mother of us all in the church. So Sarah is a type of mother church because her offspring are miraculous offspring. Hence, baptism as a second birth is our miraculous birth into this status as sons of God, children of the promise adopted sons of God, miraculous regeneration, not humanly created, works-based, human energy, natural energy. It's a supernatural energy. Rejoice, O barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate now has many more children than she who has a husband. And who gives blessing to these births? God. But we are co-workers with God, as Paul says. And so think of this also in regard to what we've seen. Is our works barren? No, we have brought thousands of people to the Orthodox Church in two years. Lord willing, we'll bring tens of thousands of people to the Orthodox Church in the next five years. Who knows? Again, I don't know. Am I saying, oh, that was all me? No, no, it's co-working with God. Synergy, Paul says. Paul says all, all throughout the New Testament, I brag because you're my work in Christ. Not saying I'm an apostle, not at all equating myself to the apostles. I'm not. All we do is point you in the direction and then you go find your spiritual father in the Orthodox Church. But you notice here that one of the signs of that blessing is the numbers and the masses who come right heretics schismatics they are barren they do not make converts in fact we've had people who have harassed for many uh well actually for two years who do these heretics bring to christ to the church no one in fact this specific group of heretics that i'm thought thinking of actually led one guy to roman catholicism out of the church and that's of course by that because they are headed up by a uniate so the subverters are desolate. They do not make converts. They tear down. And yet we have the works to prove. Right? By the fruits, you will know them. We are not barren. But in fact, our labors have given birth to thousands. 
Therefore God has confirmed this work. Now we therefore, brethren, as Isaac, are children of the promise, but he who was born according to the flesh then turns around to persecute those born of the Spirit. That is why every heretic, sectarian, schismatic, and deluded person constantly attacks, because they don't understand. They're blinded and demonically inspired. What does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman should not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then we, brethren, are not the children of the bondwoman, but children of the free. And in fact, these heretics don't even know the scriptures. They don't know anything about the text of scriptures. They wouldn't last two minutes in a discussion about the text of scripture. They would be refuted in no time. Uh, but that's why they stay in their little hovels and caves and uh, act like keyboard commandos. Did things on the Sabbath and he was criticized for it. So Jesus himself, interestingly, did not take the laws of Deuteronomy and of uh, the Old Testament very seriously. Rather, he taught something very, very different. His standard of ethics is what later came to be called the golden rule. Something that was very different from... Old the golden rule is... Uh... <laughs> I don't know why everybody loves this as like the only thing that matters. Jesus said love and then like golden rule or whatever, right? The golden rule is not the only verse in the Bible. Okay, it's not the only verse in the New Testament. It's one of many verses. And so, yeah, you, uh, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. But that's not the only thing in the Bible. Right? There's all kinds of other things in the Bible. In fact, is that said by Jesus to be the greatest commandment? Uh, no, it's not. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the next commandment? And your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so you could say, yeah, the golden rule is kind of an application of that second point, but the golden rule is not the greatest commandment. The golden rule is, right, horizontally based. The greatest commandment is... Ten Commandments, right? Love, Lord your God, first and foremost. Have no other gods. So, uh, again, uh, just a simple, stupid mistake that the New Testament nowhere says that the, you know, person-to-person -person relationship of the golden rule is the most important, right? This is a humanistic idea. Old Testament understanding, and which, again, was based upon a different theological understanding of God, not merely as lawgiver, but God as that being who is the source and the origin of love, of all love. Not merely God as a being who judges us, but God as a being who... Okay, but James says Jesus is the lawgiver. So again, false dichotomy. ...loves us. So that being said, let me read something here, actually, from one of the from one of the Gospels, and this is from Matthew. And throughout this talk, in order to give evidence of what I'm saying, I will indeed be quoting from uh, exclusively the, uh, the New Testament. The New Testament is, is a very beautiful document in the, uh, in the Bible. Uh, there are four Gospels. Okay, I don't know who Jeff... Uh, Jeff Darty is the guy who claim on, came on the stream saying, debate me, and I said, hop on, and then he ran away. So, no, I don't... I don't... I mean, why can't these people just act normal? Like, why do they have to act like complete spurgatrons who spurg out when they get the very thing that they want? So you come on this, the Rockfin streams, talk smack, I invite you on, and then you run away. I mean, it's just ridiculous. These people act like, really, I, I'm starting to think that there is no more point in debating because almost everyone who does this is insane. So maybe I just, I've accidentally stepped into a field where everyone is nuts. Okay. I come out of a philosophy background. I'm used to 20 years of debating. I've had hundreds of debates. I know the field very well. And I'm just starting to think that the, the education is so poor and people are so deluded and overly confident and overly assured of their own competence when they're almost all completely incompetent, that debate is almost becoming fruitless and worth 
worthless. There is no more. We are post debate. The whole society, you can't do debates anymore because people have lost their reason. I mean, look, look at the rest of society. We're in a situation where everyone basically things could be collapsed in the next five years. So I, we're, I think we're post debate. We can't do debates anymore. Uh, people have gone insane. So there's just stables of unstables all over the internet. And they're just nuts, dude. Just like armies of schizos. So I don't even know if you can debate anymore. And, and people don't even really understand what a debate is. They think it's like arguing and drama. And that's not what a debate is. Okay. You can use rhetoric. You can make jokes. You can have witticisms. Jabs. Okay. But going after people's family trying to ruin people that's not a debate and that's a sign of people like uh, having some serious problems okay so uh, very specifically so i'll be quoting from the four gospels that talk about the teachings of jesus and here is one of them where he indeed describes this golden rule what are what is his ethical system juxtaposed to that of the old testament and of abrahamism so this is matthew 22 verses 37 to 39. Jesus replied, quote, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So this is the golden rule. Again, Does this guy not know that that's from the Old Testament? <laughs> Uh, so the the guy in the story is being asked what the greatest commandment is and he knows the greatest commandment because it's in the law and so this guy just said that i want to juxtap juxtapose the teaching of jesus to the old testament dude this is from the old testament wow Again, this, this was the ethical foundation of what Jesus felt was the, the nature of, of true morality, it's of from true the law, ethics, dude. of true virtue. <laughs> this is from As the law. As we can see, this is something that is radically different from what we find in... No, it's not. It's from the law. The greatest commandment is in the law to love God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord with all your heart. So That's... He doesn't know what the Shema is. <laughs> what in in the uh, in the Old Testament and among the Abrahamists of his day, to the point where again they they felt that he was heretical for saying these things. Now, interestingly, <laughs> even though Jesus himself was indeed a very great being, in fact, let me talk about being. that for a moment. The Vedic what is conception what is of Jesus, being? and there what is a Vedic mean? conception of Jesus. Again, many gurus taught this, some gurus better than others, uh, but there have been many gurus in the last hundred years or so who have, who have, uh, who have taught this, including probably... So this dude is... Uh, just think about this for a second. This dude wants to comment on this religion and try to juxtapose... Judaism and what Jesus is teaching and he doesn't know the number one great commandment of Judaism the Shema so this dude is so ignorant that he doesn't know that Jesus and the right the section in Matthew 22 there is citing the most famous text of Judaism. He doesn't know what the Shema is. Or he's intentionally, right, lying. I don't know. I'm not saying, I, I don't know this guy's motives. I can't, I mean, can't judge motives. Okay. But to try to comment on these things and not know what the Shema is, is already, you are totally discredited, dude. Like you have no idea what you're talking about. Anyone who's going to comment on Judaism or this religion and doesn't know the Shema you, you're not this is so dumb dude and I hope everyone sees this I mean do you understand that it is it would be like 
it would be like saying, I'm going to talk about Christianity. I'm going to refute it. Um, what is the Sermon on the Mount? It's that dumb. Prabhupada. Um, this, is what, this is something that is supported by Vedic spirituality. Jesus himself was a yogi. Jesus himself was a guru. Jesus himself was an Avesha avatar. He was someone who... <laughs> do you not... Do you guys know the Shema? Do you? I hope so. These are the ordinances and the judgments. The Lord commanded the children of Israel in the desert when they came out of the land of Egypt. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your power. These are the words that I command to you, that they be in your heart and in your soul. You will teach them to your sons, and you will talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. They shall be as a sign to you. This dude literally just said that Jesus taught that against the Old Testament when it's literally from Deuteronomy 6 and is the most famous commandment in all of Judaism. So this is this guy is completely refuted. Who was who was empowered by the very grace of God. And we see this again in his teachings, we see this in all of his actions, in the stories about him, etc. Indeed, if you were to take the four gospels themselves and separate them from the rest of the Bible, that is certainly the Old Testament, and even the rest of the New Testament, actually. If you were to just look at the personality, the teachings, and the stories about Jesus, what you would be looking at would be non-different than a Vedic sage. Indeed, if you look at the, the Gospels, and then if you contrast these to the stories, the teachings of thousands of various Vedic sages, you'll find that there's not much difference in any way whatsoever. There might be a few cultural differences, maybe some differences in language. And that being the, the case, again, because Jesus was an individual who was teaching Dharma in a geographic... So, uh, I mean, we just gave multiple examples of Jesus talking about how he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, how he is who Moses and the prophets are talking about. And I'm pretty sure there are absolutely, totally uh, number zero yogis who say anything like that. Location where Dharma was not understood. Indeed, according to the Vedic scriptures, he was teaching among, among them lechas, that is, individuals who did not understand Dharma. So one could understand why it is the case that, indeed, Jesus, Jesus uh, stood out like a sore thumb where he was culturally. People had a very difficult time understanding exactly what he was trying to say, who he was, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, where is the argument so far that Jesus is actually a Vedic sage teaching Dharma? I've heard multiple claims. Uh, the first was that he argued with the Pharisees, so it's a different religion. Well, we debunked that easily. Uh, the second was that he didn't even teach the Old Testament religion, and this guy didn't even know what the Shema was. So that was easy, easily debunked. Um, the other one was that he just had a presence, or some, I forget what word he used, something like that. Oh, Jesus had a presence of Dharma that he was trying to communicate to a superstitious, uneducated people. Okay, what is the proof that Jesus is a Dharma sage yogi bro? Because I have not, I've not even, not really even heard an argument. I've heard a, a couple of attempted arguments, but I haven't actually heard an argument yet. So all that being said, it's an interesting thing that very often as an individual myself who I have studied religion for all of my life practically, I began studying religion really before the age of 10. It was at 10 that I began reading various scriptures of the world, including... A, a <laughs> Bro, when I was 10, like... Like, I memorized the world religions, dude. Like, probably when I was in my crib. Like, I probably read more in my crib than you read all your life, probably. Because I could, like, 
quote in, but but he doesn't know the Shema. He's been reading religion since he was ten. Doesn't know what the Shema is. Eventually, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I went on to uh, go to India and live in ashrams in various places throughout the world, in America, UK, India, etc. Uh, I'm someone who ended up getting a PhD in religious studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For someone like myself, having looked at various patterns, so <laughs> the PhD didn't tell you the like number one commandment of Judaism, the religion that you're here to critique and refute in religions. One thing that I have seen is that this is one pattern that we see repeated again and again and again when it comes to the idea of a truly great sage appearing in the world. Someone who... Jesus was a really great being, by the way. Did you guys know that? Due to the fact that they are so radically empowered by God and surrendered unto God. They have a charisma. They have a power okay. so to them. Here, here, he's finally going to give an explanation of what he means by Jesus being a dharmic individual. It's a, to, a person totally surrendered to God with a bunch of charisma. Okay, well, at least we're getting a definition, people, and that truly has an impact on world history. Whenever you have such an in okay, so anyone who has an impact on world history, who is surrendered to God, what God? I mean, you, you could theoretically have an impact and be surrendered to Satan as your God and have charisma. So like, what, what precludes evil geniuses or like Luciferian satanic elites from um, being a great being in this guy's schema? Uh, and by the way, we don't know exactly what good and evil are here. Like what's the criteria to tell a evil teacher from a good teacher and by the way there's a bunch of yogis that are a bunch of creepers and freaks dude you know that right individual appear inevitably what happens is that person of course will attract disciples that person will attract followers some of those individuals will understand the the sage and the sages teachings better than others some will understand that sage better than others. But inevitably, regardless of how powerful a sage is, eventually they have to leave. Eventually they quote unquote pass away. They leave this world. You know, being a sage does not make you someone who will remain in your body for eternity. No, a sage has a physical body like anyone else and that body eventually wears down and the person dies. What we have seen, unfortunately, is that Whenever there is indeed such a sage and that person does pass away, unfortunately, the quality of that person's teachings then kind of take a step down with the next generation. Regardless of how sincere many of the disciples of that person can be, unfortunately, it's kind of inevitable that when that person passes away, what ends up happening is a process of rigidification, a process of sectarianism, a process in which rather than trying to understand the person's teachings in a living, breathing sort of way, those teachings become rigidified in the form of a dogma, in the form of a theology. And the reason why this is the case is because very often the disciples of that person just don't know what to do. So here we have an assumption that the disciples of Christ didn't really uh, maintain the deposit of teaching that Christ gave, right? And he's got the presupposition, right, that there wasn't Pentecost, there wasn't the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that there wasn't a providential leading of the church, that Jesus didn't establish a church. When, he, again, he just saw the Gospels, apparently he hasn't read Matthew 16, Matthew 18, right? where Jesus said that he will build a church that the gates of hell would not prevail against. He says in John 16, I will send the Holy Spirit. He will guide you, lead you into all truth. He will, I will never leave you even until the end of the age, right? So yes, he came to found a church. Yes, that church has a synodal church government. It's in Acts 15. And yes, they have a power to continue that deposit of faith because of the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of Pentecost. Now, this guy has no idea about any of that. He doesn't know what any of those things are. 
and he's just got this presupposition that many low church evangelical Protestants do that there was like a core, like a simple Jesus teaching. And then Paul and the other people came along church fathers later and they added all these dogmas and these new dog, these new ideas and teachings. And that's all false. There's no proof. There's no proof of that. They just say that they just assume that the first century church was a low church Protestant guitar church with absolutely no evidence. And in fact, there's quite a bit of evidence to the contrary in liturgical scholars, archaeologists from multiple traditions that the early church was liturgical in the first and second century, that the house churches of the first century were not evangelical guitar meetings. They were liturgical services in villas that were converted into churches. Oops. So this is a false Protestant presupposition that the early churches were just low church Bible meetings. No, they were liturgical. They feel that they have no choice. You can imagine, I can imagine, I know, that when one's guru passes away, it is devastating. It's devastating, especially if this was truly a, a powerful spiritual being and you were close to that person and you were taking instructions from that person and suddenly that person is not there. It's devastating to the disciples. So this is one of the reactions that people will often have. And it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it usually does. And that is the fundamentals, the basics of what that great sage was and taught are now again made into uh, a form of statue. They are solidified. They are made into kind of a, a, a monument that is just there. And as a result, unfortunately, it becomes very difficult to then replicate the actual experience of having been in the presence of that person. When you're in the presence of the sage, you can feel God through the presence of that sage. When that sage is no longer there, the disciples yearn to experience that. Uh, again, this is the point of the mystery of Pentecost and the abiding, indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, this is what we just read in Paul. The spirit of adoption has been poured forth into our hearts by which we cry out, Abba, Father. God is now our Father because we've been adopted as sons. So what he is by nature as the Son of the Father, we become by grace, sons of grace, sons of God by adoption. So, again... Um, really no knowledge at all of the theology of Christianity, which again, I understand he doesn't believe it, but he, he should at least know what we think about these things. Even if he doesn't believe it, he would know that, you know, well, that's kind of the point of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in his presence in the church. Right. So just, just the constant sort of like, uh, fundamental mistakes and assumptions that this guy has about dialectics either ors really betray and you'll see this in a moment he's almost i think to the point where he says that christianity teaches a simple faith in justification by faith alone and he literally thinks that all of christianity has always taught the protestant doctrine of sola fide that's literally what this guy thinks that's i think one of the most embarrassing moments in this whole talk, as well as not knowing the, what the Shema is. It's that feeling again. And all that they can do to try to experience that feeling is to, again, try to immortalize the sage dogmatically. So thus, this is why I have told people many, many times that... I will give this guy one point. You might think, how could you give this guy a point in the midst of all this kind of just terrible argumentation? Um, I don't think that he's intentionally stumbling upon a correct point it's one of those you know broken clock right <laughs> at least twice a day uh what he's talking about is the idea of the direct experience of god and so in churches like the protestant church or in the roman catholic church where you have created grace where you have a very legal moralized ideas about salvation just kind of being this well um how many serious sins did you commit in this, you know, this this rigid sort of attitude, where there's no uh, clear teaching of theosis, uh, there's no clear teaching of the union that we have, the mystical union with Christ, and particularly the 
dogmatic acceptance of uncreated grace in the clear teaching of the Orthodox Church, whereby we participate in God's uncreated energies. Literally, the only way to have the doctrine of uncreated grace is to have the doctrine of the uncreated energies. And so without that, there's not a conceptual, dogmatic potential. There's not a faith in the doctrine of the direct experience of God. There is no noose doctrine in Rome. There is no noose doctrine in Protestantism. So they're not going to teach you the direct experience of God. So the one little thing that he does get right is that when he's thinking about Protestantism, basically, because that's really all this guy seems to know anything about, just in a loose sense. And he'll say that very clearly in a moment. Yes, that's correct, actually, that there is a loss of the direct experience of God. Yes. So that little nugget he does have right. That this is why in Christianity, what, what ended up happening with the followers of Jesus over multiple generations was that rather than attempting to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, they found that it was easier to just worship him from afar. So this is now he means this in the totally wrong way where he's going to say, oh, that means the doctrine of Nicaea, that Jesus is the son of God is worshiping him. When Jesus was just this dude who like told you how to he was a yogi, he was teaching you how to have a merging with the divine. Uh, no, Jesus is the means and the example to have a union with the divine, namely the person of the father, not some abstract essence or divinity out there, but actually to have a union by a communion which is a personal god so that occurs through not just exemplar or moral example theory of the atonement but through an actual union with god by the restoration and healing and deification of our nature and ultimately our whole person when we participate in that this is how jesus went from a teacher to being a demigod and the idea that oh all that is necessary is Right, so uh, obviously, again, Jesus is not a demigod. He is homoousios, of the same essence as the Father. So there's no subordination. There's no lower status. There's no metaphysical or ontological diminished status in the fact that he's eternally generated of the Father or the fact that he's distinct from the Father. He is equal in divinity and power as uh, to the Father. Um, yeah, so... Again, not even what we say. I, I don't know anybody except for Arians uh, who worship a created divinity or call him a, a demigod. Is to just have faith in this person and pray to this person and have a cross uh, with a depiction of the person up on the wall, etc., etc. It becomes easier to worship such a person rather than follow such a person rather than try to follow in False their dichotomy. footsteps and do as they did, etc. False dichotomy. And this is what has led to Christianity as we now have it today. Now, all that being said, I do indeed want to talk a little bit about theology, very specifically. And who precisely was Jesus? Because again, he is indeed recognized from a Vedic perspective. You know, for those who have read the description already of this talk, you'll know that he is actually quite literally mentioned in the Vedic scriptures. But we'll get to that in a little while. There is a Vedic perspective on Jesus. Now, first, let's talk about what is the, let's say, mainstream Nicene Creed following, uh, let's say, perspective on what is called Christology. That is, what is the nature of Christ? And that is, of course, that we know in mainstream Christianity, the idea is that Jesus is quite literally God himself, that he is fully God, fully man, but that he is quite literally God, that he is the incarnation of the Father, of God himself upon the earth. And it is for this reason, unfortunately, that again, rather than trying to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, Jesus being a guru, Jesus... Okay, so Jesus is not the incarnation of the Father. I'm sure you guys caught that right there. A simple mistake. Obviously, nobody believes that Jesus, except for perhaps some sort of modalist, Sibelian, um, um, Patrapashian. No, Jesus is not the incarnation of the Father. Jesus is the incarnation of the Son. Okay, it wasn't a mere divine essence who became incarnate. It was the second person of the Godhead, a divine person with a divine essence who became incarnate. Essences don't act. Persons 
with essences act. And it was the second person alone who became incarnate, not the Father, not the Spirit. The Son became incarnate and underwent uh, right the death, burial, resurrection, and so forth. So obviously he, as all heretics, right, don't, don't doesn't know the Trinity doctrine. This being a guide, being a master, and then thus his followers attempting to follow what Jesus actually said and did. Rather, Christianity has become a cult of worship where the idea is, oh, all you need to do is have faith in Jesus. All you need to do is accept Jesus. See? And that is the extent of the sadhana, that is, that <laughs> one is could not, say. That is not the teaching. That is the Protestant doctrine of faith alone. I think he'll even say faith alone. That is the extent of the action that one must perform nope. no, spiritually in no, order to not. have salvation. Well, of course, the Vedic perspective is something radically different from this. And it is something that is supported both in, again, the Vedic scriptures, but interestingly, even in the New Testament as well. And that is that Jesus, indeed, was not God. <laughs> what? <laughs> Flipped it over there, right? Now, um, he just says this. He doesn't give any proof text uh, that I recall. He just says he's just a man. We'll listen to this. But I think you get the point here. We don't have to keep going. We've almost gone for three hours. So we're going to do the, the Super Chats, and then we'll have a, a hopefully some time to open up uh, the Discord if we got any, any late-night uh, guys over on Discord. But remember, guys, we just went through the entirety of the Gospel of John. Um, I just linked that. And in every chapter, we see the deity of Christ and the Trinity. In every chapter. Every chapter of the Gospel of John multiple places in those chapters reinforce lucidly state over and over the deity of Christ and the Trinity anyone who is intimately familiar with just the gospel of John would know this so this is just utterly stupid it's the fallback of every cult I mean even if I didn't believe Christianity if I didn't believe orthodoxy Obviously, the Gospels teach the deity of Christ. It's just so dumb. <laughs> it's like, and the things that these people think disprove it, don't even disprove it. It's like, how God die? Okay, well, God the Son underwent death, meaning the severance of his human soul from his human body. And as St. John Damascus says, he remained impassable, right? The divine nature didn't go under undergo any change. So Muslims, again, they don't know what we're talking about. They think that they think that in our view, it's a divine essence was born into Mary and Jesus walk around and God die. So again, we have a total, you know, grand explanation from all of scripture to explain unity diversity in God in the Godhead how one hypostasis in the Godhead became incarnate not the Father not the Spirit all that Trinitarian doctrine it's all from from the text of Scripture it's not out of the minds of the church fathers making things up it's all in the text of Scripture now the text of Scripture don't say Trinity hypostasis of Christ incarnate here no it's those are words that describe the data of Revelation it's not that difficult and no, you don't get to tell us that a doctrine is false unless it's written in the text of Scripture. Uh, it says who? On, prove that presupposition. You can't. Because every time some dumb Protestant says that, they can't tell you how they came up with the right canon of Scripture because the Bible doesn't tell you the canon. <laughs> Where does the Bible say Bible? Right? By their own dumb logic, that would be self-refuting. Jesus was a human being like any other human being he was like you like me like any other human being pretty much well, this guy doesn't even encounter. give arguments he just however says this, right? he was indeed special he was, he special was indeed being. different he did so indeed here, come he falls here back, with a mission and more falls back on arianism um i'm about to plug this computer in so that we don't die in the midst of uh, going to the super chats and then the discord questions but we're getting near to kind of the essence of this guy's presentation as we see it's really weak he didn't really give a whole lot of 
uh, data. He will cite a couple more verses to try to prove some things. So let me grab the computer plug and then I'll be listening. And I, I'm going to go TT. So please excuse me while I go TT. More, it was that mission coupled with his absolute surrender to God and having become a perfected yogi, a perfected being, having in, achieved complete enlightenment, but again, coupled with that mission to save the world that made him into an Avesha avatar, what is called an Avesha avatar. And again, this is the Vedic uh, understanding of Jesus. Now, what is an Avesha avatar? An Avesha avatar is an individual who is human, but who is empowered directly by God in such a way that when you look upon that person, that person has so diminished his own false ego and his own illusion, and then also he has so surrendered to God with the mission of serving God in this world that God has fully empowered that individual with his own presence. So thus, this is what an Avesha avatar is. It's a human being who is manifesting the presence of God in such a way that when you look upon that human, yes, in a way, you might as well say that you are also looking upon God. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, this concept of the Avesha avatar, which is a very, uh, very fundamental, very basic, orthodox concept that is found in Vedic spirituality. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Because indeed, God is present with that person. So when you look upon that person, you can say that, yes, God is there. But that person is not God. That person still remains a finite being, so surrendered unto God, so empowered by God's presence, that God is with that person, and radically so. So basically, as you can tell, he's just taking texts that refer to Christ in terms of his human nature and excluding all of the other texts that refer to his divinity and saying, see, he's just a dude because he's walking around because he's finite and God's uh, not finite. So therefore he's not God, right? Well, it's a both end, right? He's the son of God. And by his divinity, he is not finite, right? But in terms of his hypostasis, willingly through the kenosis, right? He willingly limited himself to be in one place in one time. So God can step into space and time without losing divine powers because his divine nature didn't undergo any change. He is impassable. But his impassibility doesn't limit his ability to step into time and space. Hence why there were all these theophanies throughout the Old Testament. And if he's going to say that in, uh, divinity and infinity and omniscience and omnipresence, et cetera, that it can't be in time and space, then he just refuted himself by pointing out that beings are empowered by God, right, in time and space. So he's, he's still got the same problem, just like we could level this problem at the Muslims, who in their simplicity doctrine literally exclude God from being in time and space, and who then have no way to account for the miraculous or those kinds of things occurring in time and space, right? God becomes unknowable because he's absolutely dissimilar to anything in time and space. And that reduces to absurdity. We could level that same criticism to this guy, but he's just going to use more proofs like that. That's the Avesha avatar. And there have been quite a few Avesha avatars throughout history. Indeed, there have been historically more Avesha avatars, individual Atmans who are, who are quite literally empowered by God. You know, one of the stupid things about this type of line of argument is that these different world religion leaders, the syncretist approach, um, acts like all of these are just uh, uh, kind of pointing to some super grand skeletal religion, right? Like perennialism, that there's a there's a there's a super religion above the many religions that are just kind of wearing different costumes and masks for the super religion that uh, the guru kind of figures out, right? It's kind of similar to what we hear in masonry. It's what perennialists talk about. I'm not saying they're the same. I'm just saying that this, this line of argumentation, we hear this often, but this is easy to refute. First of all, the religious leaders of the world do not teach the same thing and they fundamentally disagree with one another such that they cannot all be right. And in fact, the morals and the ethics of the world religions are vastly distinct. 
And that should be obvious, right? So it's an arbitrary claim. There is no clear epistemic basis to know where we choose the true and the false amongst the buffet of religion. What's your standard by which you're going to judge? It has to be something objective or else it's just purely subjective. Oh, you say, right? Oh, this guy is going to tell us uh, this part of Islam is true. This part of Christianity is true. This part's false. This part of, uh, you know, this other world religion is true. So it's just an arbitrary thing. And that's not what Jesus does, right? Jesus makes it very clear, which this guy picks and chooses, which verses from the gospels he wants to use. But Jesus has some very uh, uh, exclusivist statements, right? No man comes to the Father but my, by me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Well, that excludes the whole ethos of Hinduism. So Jesus is not a Shyamalan, Shyamalama Ding Dong avatar or whatever. There have been more Avesha avatars upon the earth than Purna avatars, that is, full, pure incarnations of God. There are many of them. Indeed, the Buddha is one of them. Is one of them. Rishabha Deva is another. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is another. Prabhupada is another. Now, all of whom, this is all contradictory claims, but we'll just act like we're all in one big global world religion cathedral. Okay. And Jesus was also one of these Avesha avatars. So thus, when it comes to understanding the actual identity of Jesus, this is sadly where Christians have gone astray in taking this very simplistic approach in saying, oh, he's God. Of course, that's not a simplistic approach. As you know, we've done many, many lectures that we've got thousands of pages of the church fathers explaining in what sense he is the son of God incarnate, in what sense his human nature is created, is temporal, is subject to change, is passable, is deified, is raised. <laughs> I mean, there's multiple councils of the church over many centuries, right? So again, it's not a simplistic thing. He must have in his mind uh, you know, sort of simplistic evangelicals, but no, in terms of Orthodox Christianity and the Orthodox Church Fathers, this is a very precise and worked out doctrine. It's not simple. He's God. It's, it's not simplistic, I should say. In a sense, it is simple, yeah, but it, it's not simplistic. Oh, no. If we look at the at the Gospels, Jesus doesn't say this. Rather, he indicates that he is an... Oh, no, he says multiple times over, I am. He says that uh, he is equal to the father in terms of power and works all that the father has he has given to the son so totally false and we did an entire lecture through the whole gospel of john that totally refutes what he just says it's an avesha avatar very quickly let me read to you just a few of these quotes so for example john chapter 10 verse 30 where he says and this is very famous i and the father are one so again, it's in a way almost understandable how mainstream Christians would misunderstand what is being said here with Jesus supposedly saying literally, I am God. But with this conception, this Vedic conception of the Avesha avatar, we can now have a more nuanced understanding of what Jesus means by the... So notice that it's a presupposition. He just wants us to accept that Jesus is an Avesha avatar. He's not proven that. He's just accept, saying accept it. His only proofs were easily rebutted claims about how Jesus is not the same, uh, worshiping the same God as the Old Testament. Okay, that was easy to refute. So if that falls apart, then he has not demonstrated anything close to just even a smidgen of proof that Jesus is an Avesha avatar. These identity statements. He is not saying that he is God. Rather, he is saying exactly what I said a short time ago that he and God are present, that when you look upon him, you are looking at the Father. Let's look at another. No, in fact, he says that he possesses the same glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. <laughs> so, uh, easy refutation there, John 17. One of these verses, and this is from John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Again, 
It is understandable in a way that Christians would say that Jesus is quite literally saying that he is God. But no, with this added conception of the Avesha avatar, we understand that periodically throughout human history, there can be a human being who is so surrendered unto God and who has a mission to save the world such that that person has the presence of God with him. And when you look upon that person, it's almost as if you are looking at God as well. Very good. And just due to time, I'm going to skip a, a few things here. <laughs> Rather than understanding, again, Jesus as being God, as being, uh, again, this theological concept of simply Jesus being God himself, we have to understand that what Jesus is, is a teacher. Jesus is a guru. And that was the role that he, that he filled when he was here. This is why he had disciples. This is why he taught them. This is why he taught by his own example, etc. Jesus was a teacher, and he was recognized. Unless you believe I am, you die in your sins. So, again, easy refutation. The whole Gospel of John, we went through it many, many times. All right, so I think we spent enough time on this guy. He doesn't offer anything more beyond this point, after this point. Um, he will go on to say, if you really want to hear the rest of it, you can go listen to his video. Um He'll talk about one other verse in John. No, we did that one, John 14. Um, but I want you to notice too the pattern of the of an, another point here. Which, so this guy is into mysticism, Hindu mysticism. And there's always this dichotomy set up between the mystical experience and written texts and, and the Bible and theology. Now, in Orthodox theology, yes, the direct experience is more important, and it's sort of, it, you, you know and learn the scriptures and, and these things first, and those things are a springboard to the direct experience of God, right? So you can't just stay like a Protestant, oh, I worship a book. No, no, you do have to have the direct experience of God, and that's why Christ says, you search the scriptures because you think that it is in them, in them that you have eternal life, when is they the bear witness of me, pointing out that he is not identical to the Bible, as many sort of fundamentalists think. No, he is a divine person. He's not the same thing as a physical book, but that physical book does reveal him and does require the Holy Spirit to open our minds to understand it, as we saw in Luke 24. So the point being, um, people like this guy set up false dichotomies where it's like Christianity as a whole is a religion based around this book, which is a misunderstanding of the original Gnostic Jesus. And so you see it is the presupposition of a Gnostic understanding of Jesus as an Avesha avatar, which he did not prove and didn't even come close to anything <laughs> just near a proof at all. His arguments were terrible and easily refuted. Uh, there and and it's a presupposition, and then he he hinted at a couple times. There's a real kind of a secret inner teaching of Jesus that we have the key to that he couldn't convey openly to those uh, people around him because they were kind of you know primitive Palestinian people or whatever. Uh, and he says, if you go and listen to the rest of his talk, he's going to say, here is the. Uh, Hindu text where we identify Jesus as having gone to the Himalayas. I'm not joking to meditate. And he said, he says, and, and our, our, just trust what our texts say. So some Hindu text claims Jesus went to the Himalayas to meditate. And that proves Jesus is an, uh, an avatar basically. And you don't need to listen to what the Bible says, although listen to the few verses that I pull out that talk about Jesus being a human, okay? This is, I think, evident to everybody, I think, in this audience, how faulty and silly these arguments were. In fact, he even goes on to equate Jesus to like a Socrates and a Plato and a Pythagoras. I mean, it's so lowbrow and thin, this line of argumentation. And it's couched in all this stuff to do with these, you know, mystical th sounding things and all these names of gurus. But you just saw how f how flimsy this argumentation was, right? This this wouldn't last five minutes in a debate. This guy would be refuted in no time. 
And I guarantee you that in terms of logic and debate, he has no idea what he's talking about. So th there's no there's no epistemological principle by which to judge these different religious teachers other than just what he thinks is cool, right? Hippie Jesus is the real Jesus. And we have the true Gnostic sense of the text of Jesus. And you go read the Vedas and it will give you the, he says this, the, the real Gnostic sense of what's being taught here. Exact same thing that, that Irenaeus explains about the Gnostics. The Gnostics claim to have Jesus' secret teaching and then all of that publicly taught dogma in the churches, the Orthodox Catholic churches, yes, in Irenaeus' day, those are for the uninitiated, the stupid people. You don't really know what you're talking about. It's all pride and pre -lit. Oh, we have a secret doctrine. We're better than you. You are a silly, superstitious Christian. Now, the irony is that the delusion is there, obvious, just seeping off of, it's dripping off of these people, and they can't even do basic logic. They can't even do a basic presentation that's coherent and consistent showing their position. This guy doesn't even know what the Shema is, and he's going to critique this religion. Do you see the absurdity of this? The... the delusion in this and that's what every one of these gnostic goobers thinks is that they've attained this like great high insight and literally when you get them into discussing what their great insight is it's pure gibberish it's marty leeds stuff okay this guy fundamentally no different than marty leeds he has the gnostic secret key you start asking him what it is and it's schizo stuff Jesus is all waking conscious reality, man. Total, meaningless, just gibberish. All right, let's get to the Super Chats. And I think maybe we'll open up uh, for a little bit of Q&A. Maybe, I don't know if there's anybody in there. If nobody's in there, maybe we won't. But we'll take a look and see. All right, so uh, I'm going to pop in here. We're going to take over for the uh, Q&A. Are you guys okay with that? Let's go. Let's do it. All right, so I got a, I got a, su a few Super Chats. Those guys get the priority because they gave the Super Chats, and then I'll go to you guys for anybody who wants to debate or uh, offer a question, whatever. Odin said, Odin Benitez. Okay, Odin can't be combined with South and Latin American deities. So you, you can't be... Uh, an Odin guy in Mexico, dude. Ten bucks. What do you think? What's your refutation of Elaine Pagels? Okay, so that's all Gnostic gospel stuff. We've done multiple refutations of Gnosticism. Um, first of all, the Messiah. We're not ready yet, guys. Hold on. Somebody. I don't know why these guys can't mute. Can you please mute if you're not talking? So. Uh, we just went through all these messianic prophecies, okay? Uh, you say, what about Elaine Pagels? Because prophecy historized, okay? I don't know what that means. The prophecies of his death and resurrection are anticipated, and they just found someone to fit the bill. So the reason this doesn't work is that the Jewish interpretation of those texts admits their messianic texts. So the Jews didn't accept that the Messiah would come and die and be buried and resurrected. And there's dozens and dozens of these, right? So even though their books have even the date that he would come and die, it's not possible that they could have a date of a guy coming and dying and living 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple. Do you think that the Jews wanted the temple to be destroyed of course not right but in matthew 24 and in luke 21 jesus gives explicit predictions of exactly how and in what way the temple would be destroyed in 70 a.d by titus vespasian it all occurs 40 years later and in fact those uh, 70 a.d the prophecy pro prophesied destruction of the temple texts come out of old testament texts in jeremiah in ezekiel right 
in Maccabees as well. So the abomination of desolation that Jesus mentions in Luke 21 is referencing Daniel and the Maccabees. And so what I'm trying to point out here is that it's not just a matter of prophecies about Jesus's life. There are Old Testament prophecies about the destruction of the temple and an unheard of thing happening that when this temple is removed and destroyed, the Gentile nations will convert to believe in and worship the God of Israel. So do you understand that it's not, oh, here's a few obscure texts about a guy who dies and we'll say he resurrected and we'll find a dude to fit the bill. Nobody in the first century could predict entire globe Gentile nations converting to worship the God of Israel. That is impossible. And in fact, people thought the Old Testament prophets were crazy when they predicted it. Throughout the Psalms, back in the Abrahamic covenant, all the nations, families of the earth would be blessed in your seed. Romans 15, citing the Psalms, saying, You in Rome, Gentile and Jew together, are the fulfillment of the promises of Abraham, of all the nations and islands and coasts of the earth, worshiping the God of Israel. To him, a light unto the Gentiles, we, he will bring salvation. He is a light unto the Gentiles, Isaiah said. The Messiah will come and be a light unto the Gentiles. Read the Gospel of John. John cites Isaiah, saying that when Jesus went and preached to the Gentiles, that was fulfilled. So when you are biblically literate and understand the biblical patterns, it's not just a couple things about the life of Jesus. It's all the way from Genesis, all the way up through the Psalms, the writings, the prophets. And it's not just the prediction of a church, not just the prediction of the destruction of the temple. It's the entire Gentile world coming to worship the God of Israel. Do you understand how impossible that would have seemed even in Jesus' day? What? How will the Gentiles, how is it even possible? They can't come to Israel. How can all of the nations worship the God of Israel when the God of Israel demands that you worship in Jerusalem? It's not even possible. Well, they didn't understand the full picture, right? The Old Testament saints and believers and prophets, they knew there was a Messiah coming. They knew that somehow the Gentiles would be converted. They didn't know that their own people would put the Messiah to death that he would be resurrected and that he would open the covenant to all the nations. The church is the proof of Christianity. Do you understand this? The church is the proof of Christianity. Charlie B, five bucks. Your interpretation of Matthew seven, do not give to the dogs what is holy. Do not give pearls before swine. If you do, uh, they trample it under your feet. And then you turn, they turn and tear you to pieces. All right, so Jesus is giving us the principle to recognize people for who they are and what they are. Thus, obviously, this is a great text to show that we must exercise just judgment. It's not possible to have no judgment. And all the goober evangelicals who say, and the piety p signalers who get on the internet and say, don't judge people, dude. Is uh, no one talking for a reason? Yeah, because we're uh, live on air, so hold on. I apologize. That's no, okay. I'm going to leave it. I'll leave it on. So why are we not to judge? We don't judge with unrighteous judgment. Jesus says in John 7, 24, judge with righteous judgment. And so we have to judge then when people are dogs and swine and don't give our pearls to them. And yes, it's not wrong to call people dogs and pearls and swine. The Bible does it often. It calls heretics dogs, demons. So, uh, Another example of this is when Paul says what to Titus, reject the heretic of the first and second warning because such a man is self-condemned and you're wasting your time. So that's what that verse means. Well, Emmanuel, $5, does ecumenism promote unity and peace? No, it does not. Originally, ecumenism was a missionary movement. Read Father Peter Hears' little book, The Missionary Origins of Ecumenism. It then becomes co-opted and taken over soon after it begins to be an engine of geopolitical interests and also, uh, in many cases, papal interests. 
Um, you said Roman Catholics made it appear to me that it was to promote unity and peace. No, in fact, if you read Mortalium Animos of Pope Pius XI, Pius XI meetings are apostasy, and within a few decades, the Roman Catholic Church flips that position, contradicts itself, and says ecumenism and interfaith gatherings are the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's the easiest way to refute Roman Catholicism right there. John for $5. I'm attempting to watch a full basic basic metaphysics video. Uh, that was a long time ago. This is video unavailable. Okay, so YouTube had this update to make old videos older than 2017 private. So I'll have to go back and fix those videos like that older than 2017. So thank you for that, John. I appreciate it. And thank you for reminding me. Uh, you said, what should I do? Well, there is the audio. So you can also listen to the audio of that lecture. Um, I think also it's on the Patreon and the Rockfin, but I will try to fix those older videos as quick as I can. Thomas G. My name is Jeff. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thomas G. Hindu is so bad. It makes Islam look good. Thomas G. Alex Fanau. You need to watch. I don't know who Alex Fanau is, but he says, Alex Fanau, watch all of Jay's videos on Protestants. Bay's simple. 10 bucks. I appreciate your work. Were there different canons of scripture during the time of Jesus? No. Uh, well, it, like, if you mean, did the Jews have kind of competing and different lists of canonical texts? Yes. If you mean a church canon? No, because the church didn't exist yet. Or were they drawn from one canon with various traditions? No. So there's not uh, really an attempt by Jews, at least, to make a canon. And remember, Jews didn't believe in Sola Scriptura. They believed in oral tradition, as we do, uh, until this sort of theorized idea of the Council of Jamnia. Now, we don't know for sure that there was a Council of Jamnia. It's kind of a theory that people think, okay, after the first, second century of Christianity, in order to oppose the menim, as they were called, and that's what the Jews would call Christians, the menim, they wanted a kind of a canon so that Christians would stop using the Septuagint because they utilized the Septuagint so frequently and so much to prove Christ, right, to convert people, that they kind of had this proto-canon of a council of Jamnia. But whether that exa exactly existed, we don't know. And I'm not sure that we even really know when Judaism has a canon proper. Uh, it seems to have been a debated thing. Obviously, as we get up into the later centuries, the rabbinical tradition, I guess, did have some kind of Masoretic text, Jamnia text, canon of scripture. Pacific Samis dot 20 bucks. Hindu New Age gurus claim that Jesus, claim Jesus, but they also reject any concept of a church or Jesus. Yeah, or, well, they give a Jesus of their own painting and image, you see. That was the thing that we wanted to get to today, was to show that the Jesus of gurus, the Jesus of cults, the Jesus of Islam, the Jesus as a Vedic sage, the Jesus of the Gnostics, is not Jesus. It's a fake Jesus. And cult leaders and Gnostics have spent 2,000 years inventing and making up fake Jesuses, Hippie Jesus, New Age Jesus, blah, 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 blah. The only way that we know Jesus is to go to the Bible and to go to the ethos of the Bible, which is the Orthodox Church. That's how you know what Jesus taught and where you find his teachings. All the other ones are fake Jesuses. They might have a piece of the truth, bits and pieces, some of it. But those aren't the real Jesus. John, Jane Doe, $3. Thank you, Jane Doe. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, there was more uh, question by Sami's Dot. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the book Guru, the Young Man and the Elder by uh, Elder Paesios is really instructive on this. Yes, that is a book as well as Father Seraphim Rose's book, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future, that principally refute this nonsense. And I did a whole talk on, orth on Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. You can watch that on the Rockfin or on the channel here. Um, yeah, I mean, this book is a great refutation of everything that we're talking about today because the religion of the future here is really just a kind of a a, a loose New Agey Hinduism. And none of these positions can give you a coherent, grounded epistemology to actually tell you true and false. 
It's just made up. It's just arbitrary and subjective. Jane Doe, three bucks. Thomas G, two dollars. Would you make a video on Zoroastrianism? Um, I suppose I don't know much about Zoroastrianism. I mean, I know, I guess, the basics. I know about it being, you know, kind of a dualistic thing. I know about Ahura Mazda. I know about those ideas, but um, literally never met a Zoroastrian. You're the probably the first person I can ever think of talking about uh, Zoroastrianism. You said also Nick Pluto is a Spurg in the chat constantly asking about this and the Venus Lucifer connection. Well, I didn't see Nick Pluto's comments, so I don't know what the Venus Lucifer connection is. I mean, Lucifer is likened to the morning star and so is Jesus, right? So the morning star is a multivalent symbol in scripture. And this should instruct all the goobers who go around acting like I'm a Satanist because of you know, satirical pictures that I took or because of, uh, you know, this or that image when symbols and, and these kinds of things have different meanings in different contexts, right? Lions are lions satanic or do they teach us about Jesus? Well, they teach us both in different contexts. Satan is a lion going about seeking whom he may, whom he may devour. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay. So a, a lion can be two things, dummies in the same way. The morning star, Jesus is called the bright and morning star because of the resurrection. And Lucifer is likened to the morning star for different reasons. So don't be dumb and low IQ when it comes to symbolism. John Godby, thank you for your subscription. Tom G, $1. Oh, we already did that. Okay. No, you did. Uh, Alex... He, you keep talking about, I don't know who Alex Finau is, but you keep saying the reason that you're, maybe this is somebody in the chat. Uh, God is pulling you towards orthodoxy. Please watch Jay's videos on Protestant. Okay, so if that guy's still in the chat, uh, whoever Alex is, go watch the Protestant videos. Thomas G. again to, to Alex in the chat. You should read the Apostolic Fathers. They were the disciples of the apostles. St. Polycarp, Clement of Rome, Ignatius. Yes, great, great guys to read. Also read the lives of the Orthodox Saints. Uh, ju just look at the people that the Orthodox Church produces. They are holy. Yes, exactly. J. Mel, $30. Is there any Christian teaching whereby we ask Christ to come in and take over our bodies and souls like the Vedas teach of their deities? Well, we definitely want to participate in Christ, but the doctrine of theosis in the Orthodox Church is that we never lose our identity. So there's a synergy that's always going on where we participate in God. We are fully deified and divinized. The, the divine energies penetrate our whole being. That's our goal, right? But we don't lose our identity or our being as creatures. So we retain our created nature and, and its properties at the same time as participating in the divine life and being deified. That's the unique Orthodox doctrine. And it's never a falling over into this sort of melding into the, the divine nature or divine, some abstract divine unity. Family plan sends $5. Your work is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And again, although we weren't directly treating Gnosticism today, guys, remember that I did do multiple talks in the past about Gnosticism the Gnostic Jesus, the Gnostic doctrine of creation and refuting those things as well in past talks. And everything that you heard today's guy talking about is the exact same approach and argumentation of the Gnostic Jesus, you see. Pixar Freak, five bucks. Question, was it Jesus and not the Father who spoke to the people in the Old Testament? No. So it was always a Trinitarian revelation. But the Father is only manifested in the person of the Son. Hence why Jesus says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. As the Father sent me, so I send you. So the, 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 the icon of the Father, the only icon of the Father in the New Testament, is the person of the Son. He is the direct image, icon, and representation of the person of the Father, according to Hebrews 1. So it is not only the Father speaking, or excuse me, uh, Jesus speaking in the Old Testament. It's the Father speaking through the Son in the Spirit. So it's always triadic. But in our theology, each person in the Trinity has a unique role or mode that they uniquely instantiate or manifest that one action. 
So it is the Father speaking through the Son in the Spirit. Jesus does this, the Father speak directly to people as well. Now, typically, we would say that this is covered in the Icon Councils. If you read uh, Al Spensky's book, Theology of the Icon, Volume 2, it covers this question of how do we interact with or see or know the Father. It is never the hypostasis of the Father directly. We can have an aidos, an idea, an idos of the Father, but not the direct representation of the hypostasis of the Father. And so that's why we don't do uh, heterodox Roman Catholic icons that picture the Father as an incarnate old man. We're not supposed to. You can, however, and by the way, many of those icons teach filioque, but there is an, a place for the idos of the Father being represented in iconography and hence the Rublev icon of the three visitors, right? Two angels, one in the middle is the Logos. But the three re does represent the Trinity, but it is not the hypostasis of the Father that's an angel. That would be heterodox. We don't believe that. So no man sees the Father at any time, but we can have an, an idea of the Father, but the direct experience of the Father is only in the face-to-face -face relationship of the Son. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is never imaged in his hypostasis. This is the teaching of the Icon Councils of Moscow. Why? Because we're never told what the hypostasis of the Spirit is. So his manifestation as dove, his manifestation as tongues of fire, the Moscow Council state is his energetic manifestation, not his hypostatic representation. We do not represent the hypostasis of the Father or the Holy Spirit. We only signify them in the energetic manifestation of the Spirit and the idos of the Father. Matthew 3.17, is it the Father speaking? It is, right? So there is a manifestation of the Father speaking there. It is a theophany, but it is not the, like the voice speaking is not the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm excuse me, the, the person of the Father, right? So the Father is speaking, yes. His energetic manifestation is present, but we are not seeing the Father, right? Jesus says, you heard the voice, you saw no form. Just like in the manifestation of God, right? You hear the voice in Mount Sinai, but you see no form. The Israelites didn't. Moses, however, did go up on the mountain and saw the form of God, the Son of Man, the Son of God. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, okay, let's go to the uh, Discord chat. Is there anybody in the Discord that would like to um, discuss anything or Q&A or bring forth anything? Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, the first question is, I was watching your lecture, your Montanica lecture. Towards the end, you were talking about how um, absolute divine simplicity would be a problem for the incarnation. Like, how would uh, Christ become incarnate on earth? Like, would it be a created grace as well, or...? Did you say created grace? I'm confused. What? Yes, like how is the conception of um, uh, the incarnation in like the Roman Catholic view? Because God is pure act. And I'm guessing like uh, his son, uh, pre-incarnate son also has to be pure act as well or something like that. Right, so again, oh, there's, I... there's a theologizing about God in his simplicity that is done as if you can do that apart from the Trinitarian doctrine. This is the point of natural theology is to do all the speculation about God's essence and what he must be in a definitional sense, in an essential sense, such that this pure act doctrine then contradicts and makes the incarnation impossible because we need a Trinitarian theology that allows for one hypostasis to enter into a mode of being that the other two do not. So the Father and the Spirit don't become incarnate. The Son does. But if you have a really strict pure act absolute divine simplicity doctrine as Thomism definitely does it becomes difficult to see how it's possible for one hypostasis in the trinity that's pure act to do something the other two do not you see so there's an there's such a stress on unity and eunomian simplicity there that it's contradictory to the 
incarnational theology they do over here where they want their cake and to eat it too. Does that make sense? So it's like two different systems that work yes. in one system. Yeah, I can see that. And the second question, last question, um, is um, um, I was watching the debate between Cabain and um, this guy, what's his name? Slick, Matt Slick. And like, could you say like this uh, concept of like a word concept fallacy, sorry, um, whereby debt means what it's supposed to mean in the lexicon, in the Greek lexicon and in the dictionary and not in like the context of scripture and the story of Christ. Was, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I, I was like asking, is that a fallacy on his part? So I, I have not yet heard the debate between Matt Slick and Cobain. Uh, I've heard he did really well. I'm sure he did. Um, I think that was a totally mismatch thing. I think Cobain is far superior to that goober. He deserves better than somebody like that. Um, he shouldn't have to be talking to people that ridiculous. So I don't know what happened in that debate, but I'm sure he won. And um, my guess would be that that's probably correct, that Matt came to the table with this all these assumptions about what guilt, debt, penal substitution have to mean without ever questioning his presuppositions. And the irony about Matt Slick is that he claims to be a presuppositionalist, but literally turns around and says that the texts of scripture mean what they say and they say what they mean. They don't require interpretation. So he literally acts like an evidentialist when it comes to scripture while claiming he's a presuppositionalist, wherein he should know that nothing is neutral, right? Texts are theory laden but he doesn't probably even know what that refers to or what that's talking about so would you like do a, de a review on that debate or something uh well cabane is coming on the channel this weekend um mm -hmm. so we'll be doing another follow-up to uh the biblical theology talk that we did last time so maybe he and i can can touch on some of those issues when when he comes on we'll see yeah, because I found like his uh, stuff was a bit um, interesting, you know, his mm -hmm. perspective, but thank you. Thank you. And uh, somebody's asking, this is always what we get, uh, Kev TV, are you scared of debating the Reformed Stoic? Dude, I don't know who the Reformed Stoic is. So people always do this thing where they, like, I don't, so I, so I don't know some random dude with two or three thousand subscribers or less. And then it's like, oh, you don't, you won't debate him because you're scared. I have no idea who you're talking about. We always open this up for anyone to come debate. Here is the link. And no, I don't owe some random dude a platform so that he can get a bunch of clicks over to his channel with 500 people. But if he would like to come to the Discord and he can have the floor, he is more than welcome to debate. But I don't know who the Reform Stoic is. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Uh, uh, I just, or, oh. Okay. Yeah. So basically, an Oriental Orthodox Christian here, and I'm curious uh, what your thoughts on possible unity with the between the East and the or Oriental Orthodox Church. I know we're, uh, from my understanding, Chalcedon is based is uh, the disagreement about Chalcedon is on a definitional basis, and curious uh, what implications we could have if we were to unite. Uh, yeah, so we've had this question come up quite a bit, and um, I think that the main issue beyond the words and the definitions, even if that gets settled, which most Orientals will look at the Fifth Council and agree that we're basically trying to express the same thing at the Fifth Council, that was a council intended to reconcile the Orthodox with the Orientals. So if that was surmounted, the main problem then would be, well, you guys have saints that we think were in error. So I don't know how we would ever get past that point. Um, and I don't see a way to talk around that. It's kind of a, an either or. So that's my only answer to that question. So what about like regional saints? Like uh, I'm under the Indian Orthodox Church and we have a few, we only have like a few canonized saints. Would they be, be I'm talking about people like Severus of Antioch and these kind of people. Oh, okay. So I don't know what your church views, how you view Severus. I don't know. Uh, I think we have as in the fifth diptych. So I do, I do think we have a, we 
acknowledge him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think those are the the, the problems. So, yeah, beyond that, I'm not I'm not sure how to answer that question other than to say that I, I'm not sure that those issues are surmounted. Somebody's going to have to like admit, okay, we were wrong, <laughs> right? Understood. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, this isn't a question, but I, I would just like to point out the absolute ego of the guy. Um, so his name Shri, and um, the first letter is Shri means Lord in Sanskrit, but it's like a divine Lord, like you would call like Krishna, like Shri Krishna, like Lord Krishna. So he's essentially calling himself a god in his name, which he gave himself. Hmm. Interesting. No, I, di- I didn't even know that. I don't know much about this whole system and their beliefs. Um, I'm sure that guy's going to make a, if he hears about this, he'll make a big deal about this. This guy doesn't even know our position. Okay, but you came to critique our Christianity position and you knew nothing about it either. So, um, but on a basis of philosophy and debate, I can also point out that I think this guy has no clue what he's talking about. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I, the rest of my notes, I had more points to say. Um, it reminded me of the way people who do DMT and LSD and shrooms when they have their divine meetings and revelations that it produces in them this extreme pre where they think that they've solved the universe and that they're called to become gurus. And it's so obviously motivated by an evil spirit. Yeah. Um, I've read his book, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, from what I understand of his history, he actually has studied in India with like, you know, real gurus over there, but mm-hmm. he's completely insane. Um, what, and why, some, why do you say he's completely insane? Um, some of his political, like he, he just, he's got these ideas that like, you know, he, he's melded like, like he thinks that, uh, Marxism is like a fourth Abrahamic religion. Right. So he said that early on and he said, oh, but I wrote a book. I'm not going to give you the arguments. Uh, Do you recall like his basic argument as to why that's the case? It's like a, it's like a, I'm sorry. It's kind of late and I'm retarded, but it's like, um, uh, he, he took, it's like, it's, uh, taking these Abrahamistic Abrahamic ideas of like, you know, equality or whatever and then putting them into like the idea that everyone's equal before god and then putting that into like a political thing and and that's what makes it abrahamic okay so kev tv has multiple profiles and he keeps spamming the chat that i'm afraid to debate the guy that i just told you i'm happy to debate so how like you've got how many bot profiles dude and i'm giving you the discord link dude and you and you and your buddy can come debate. So there it is. It doesn't have to be on the channel. You can come to the Discord. He's got another. Dude, this guy has like, is this an insane person? How many bot profiles do you have? You are scared to debate Reform Stoke. I don't even know who Reform Stoke is. And I'm telling you right now, you can come debate. But this is probably like, this is a bot. It's probably not even a real guy. Um, anybody else? Kev, why don't you come... <laughs> Dude, look at all these profiles. This is a bot, isn't it? Come debate, Kev. There's your link. You're welcome. I'm telling you all debate reform stoic, dude. He's got another profile. This is about the 30th bot that we've deleted here. Anyway, does anybody in the chat have any questions? Q&A open? Discord bros? If you want to look at the chat, there's a Protestant going off on us and kind of playing himself. His name's uh, David the Hushed. In the what chat? Uh, Gen 1. Uh, I mean, it, what, does, does he want to come here and come on here? I asked him to, but I think he's kind of scared. Yeah, they never want to come on here. So, yeah. Um, anybody else in the chat? If not, we'll we'll close it up. Uh, yeah, I, I got a question. Oh, okay. oh, go ahead. One at a time. Go ahead. So, in terms of the Oriental Orthodox, uh, I'm not too familiar, but wouldn't the Sixth Council of the multiple energies in Christ be more of a problem for them rather than the communicatio idiomatum? 
Right, so the main problem for them is not so much uh, a an advanced essence energy issue. So because typically their theology is not super precise or advanced on that. And my point was just simply that the fifth council was intended to explain that we want to read Chalcedon in a neo Kyrillian way. So the main hang up for them is Chalcedon. So the fifth council was intended to, was met. Justinian wanted them to come back into communion. So he wanted to try to understand all of the problems, all of the objections that the Monophysites had. And so the whole purpose and decision of the fifth council is that you have to read Chalcedon in a Kyrillian way. This is well known. It's not disputed. All the literature on this, Magakin, the, the Leontii, the Leontian doctrine, Leontius of Jerusalem, his in hypostatic doctrine is accepted. And in hypostasis is intended to explain to the Gnosticites how we understand that the Logos is divine and in what sense he's composite, which is the two natures that he possesses. Okay? So they're not at the point where they're going to be able to have a worked out essence energy doctrine relating to the, the Diophysite arguments of Maximus against Pyrrhus. So if they did want to get to that point, yes, we would have to explain to them how nature, uh, th that, that will and energy are faculties of nature and not hypostasis, right? And so if they understand that, then yes, that would be helpful. But they don't, they will argue that will and nature are, um, that energy and, and will are faculties or properties of hypostasis in the incarnation. And then it's not that in the Trinity. So that they don't have that reflexivity that we have. And so you have to, you have to get over that problem first, right? Before you can get to what happens at the sixth council. So again, I don't think that they have, I mean, we've had countless talks with these people here. David's had multiple debates with them. Um, and when you start talking about essence and energy, almost all these guys get lost. They don't know what you're talking about. So I think we have to kind of step back and do more legwork. But to be precise, no, I'm not trying to be an ecumenist, if that's what you're trying to imply. I'm not trying to say that we don't have to listen to the Sixth Council. I'm well aware that Maximus' teaching at the Sixth Council is all predicated on Chalcedon and Diophysitism. Because energy signifies nature. If there's two wills and two energies, then there's two natures. So I know all that. But I'm trying to tell you that the locus of this debate is really at the fifth council. So it has to be settled there. Then we can talk about the sixth council stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you. Who was the next person? Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we know that Christ is the logos and the divine essence is incomprehensible. So would it be fair to describe the apostles' relationship to Jesus only through uh, the Logi? Well, uh, St. Gregory Palamas says that all of God's actions are in hypostatic. And so they have a direct interaction with uh, Christ in terms of his divine and human energies. And so both the divine and the human energies are coming from a single hypostasis, the person of Christ right so they're in hypostatic and so no they're not just interacting with christ's logi they're interacting with all of the uh actions of christ proper to the created order divine love is not identical to a logi and they really are experiencing divine love divine glory is not identical to the logi because the logi only relate to the created order divine glory would have been and is the case whether he created or not. Does that make sense? Oh, look at all these bots in the chat, right? So we've got literally like now all these Protestant and porn bots spamming the chat. It's crazy. Hello? Anybody there? Oh, yeah. Thanks for answering. Um, I had a question. Uh, uh -huh. What are your thoughts on this? Is one at a time. Oh, just what were your thoughts on the debate between Sarah from Hamilton and Matt Slick? I know you've. Uh, I, I just said I haven't Matt heard Slick it. I, I, just, uh, I just said Do I haven't. Do you feel like he um, 
did all right or that he could I just some other things said I haven't seen the debate do you hear me hello can you hear me yeah I'm sorry about that no it's okay I was just saying I I just told the previous Don, Bantu that I I've not heard the debate but I'm sure he did good Who's next? Another question, yeah. General. Um, Go ahead. Just a kind of thing. Uh, do you have any plans on ever interacting with uh, Al Fadi from the Syria channel, the Center of Islamic Research? Uh, I've already done an interview with him. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah. We did a whole uh, hour and a half on the Trinity. So, I mean, he 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 liked it, but then I don't know if he never mentioned anything else. So. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Look at all these bots. This is crazy. It's like Yogi bots are here. Who's next? Anybody else? Should we should we close it up? Is there a list of the uncreated energies? No, the church fathers say that God's works are infinite. You could never know or list or exhaust the thoughts and works of God, they're infinite. Okay, so this is Matt Slick sending his insane people to to bring porn bots and spam bots. So that there you there you see the quality of people that we're dealing with with uh, uh, Matt. So and you and now you guys see why I mentioned the things that I mentioned to him. This is these are insane people. So here we go. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I think we'll uh, close it up here. Um, this has been fun. Hopefully, it was helpful to people. Uh, be sure to hit like and share. Origin is not a saint. There's no such thing as, as a saint origin. So, no, there is no saint origin. Origin is a heretic, and he died outside the church, and he's condemned by three ecumenical councils. So, there is no saint origin. Um. Uh, everybody have a good night. God have a